Buenos dias. Wow, it's so great to see you all. It's been like two years. Dos años duros. Thank you so much uh, for your powerful work. Uh, each of you during this pandemic have become uh, an emergency room for small businesses. And I'm very proud of our national network of Hispanic chambers. You all are so strong. You've overcome so much adversity and you're creating new history for our country. And it, it is my a deep pleasure to work for a board of directors represented by our members, our chambers, our corporates, our Hispanic business enterprises, the way it should be. Uh, we um, are accountable to you. We work for you. And we want you to know that we're also building a great staff and a great team that is professional, that has chamber experience, uh, that understands the private sector, but also has a heart and is at your uh, disposal when it comes to customer service. Um, we're only as strongest as our weakest link. And so I just, uh, I'm just so glad to see each of you here. I'm like you, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm here for, uh, for all the right reasons and all the wrong reasons. Everybody's like, are you going to Vegas? I said, we're going to Vegas. We got an outstanding uh, Latino chamber and uh, run by an outstanding, passionate champion for small businesses in Peter Guzman. And, and uh, we're going to show strength. We're not going to blink. We're, gonna, we're not going to be afraid of this pandemic. We're going to overcome it. And so I just want to thank each of you for showing your strength in our national power as a Latino business organization for being here, for letting people know that um, we are the future of this nation. And you all are from Rhode Island all the way to Seattle, South Florida, Puerto Rico, deep South Texas, all the way to Los Angeles and, uh, and even Hawaii in the last uh, year and a half joined. They sent me an email, they said, aloha and hola. Uh, I mean, that, that brought tears to my eyes. 10% uh, of the 1.1 million people in, in the Hawaiian islands self-designate as Latinos, according to the census. So you all know we're, we're, we're an ethnic group. We're not a race. We're white, Asian, Afro-Latino. We're all different kinds. But what we have that unites us is our culture and our passion and our entrepreneurship. And we are leading America's largest economy into the future, uh, very powerful. So, me da un, un privilegio trabajar por ustedes. Es un honor para mí trabajar por el Consejo, por Alice Rodriguez y los miembros del board que están aquí. Para mí, este es, este es un trabajo muy importante. Y yo trabajo por ustedes. Nomás quiero retirarles, retirarles eso. Bueno, eh, le prometí a, a mi distinguida amiga Hope Field uh, cinco minutos porque queremos escuchar de uno al otro. We have an all-day training today to make us better and to learn from one another. And this dream, this vision came from Hope Field uh, and her mom Esperanza uh, Porras uh, uh, Field. And so I just want to say thank you. Hope, thank you, Esperanza, for, for having this dream to say, let's do a training for each other, but where the chambers train each other because we're the, the ones that are doing it. Let's not bring in academics only. Let's bring in real life people. So with that, thank you, Hope. Uh, we thank you for your support of the chamber for so long and, and for your investment through Coca-Cola. Let's give Hope a round of applause, please. Thank you, Hope. And now, uh, and we'll get to visit later. If y'all need anything, let me know. Uh, I, I just, and I want to thank Monica for really staffing this up. She just started this year. Let's give Monica a big round of applause. Monica Garza. Um, we also have, uh, I know, Cynthia Jaramillo, who just joined us. Cynthia, thank, congratulations. Uh, she, uh, again, both, uh, both uh, very expert so, uh, and I know we've got the rest of our team uh, in, elsewhere, but bef before I introduce uh, the next speaker, I just wanna say thank you to Las Vegas. Las Vegas has opened up its arms. Las Vegas is a Latino city. Nevada is the sixth largest Latino population of any state in America. 
And it is a state that um, has entrepreneurship at a higher level than the national average. So there's really good chemistry here when it comes to business startup and, and entrepreneurship. And um, I'm just so proud that the first gala that I spoke at when I joined the chamber a little less than three years ago was at the Las Vegas Latino Chamber of Commerce. I took 90 days to to kind of figure out where the front door was at, at the office in Washington. But I said, uh, December 1, 2018, I'll be with you, Peter. And uh, so thank you, Peter, for your being my brother. Thank you for making things happen for us. When I picked up the phone and we had no place to go because uh, we decided to meet in person and a lot of our options were, were not available. Um, I called uh, my brother, Peter, and I said, Peter, I know you've wanted this for a long time. It's never been. You're one of the oldest chambers, Latino chambers. Um, and I knew his uh, predecessor, Otto Merida, another outstanding leader. But Peter, um, this is going to be the best conference ever because of you, because of your chamber and your, your board leaders. Your, I know your chair is here. Buenos dias. Thank you so much for opening up Las Vegas. And at this time, it is my honor to introduce the great business leader and champion for Latino business, not just for Las Vegas, but for the whole state of Nevada, Mr. Peter Guzman. So I don't, I don't even uh, know where to begin because it's been somewhat of an emotional journey and I'm not gonna bore you with all the emotion, but uh, it has been an emotional journey to get to this point right now. And I'm just, I don't know when it finally hit me. I think when I got a text message from Ramiro uh, at the airport saying he saw himself on the biggest screen at the airport on video. And we got that on every single screen at the airport for the next four days. Why? Because we're Latinos and we matter, we matter. I want to warn you in advance that what happens in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas. Don't fall for that. Be careful. Con cuidado. Con cuidado. But let me just say that I open up my heart, my arms for each and every one of you and everybody who's going to attend this. I'm so grateful that you took a chance and you're here in person with us. And I promise you that it's very, very appreciated. Appreciated by me. Appreciated by the employees that are now working because this event is happening. People that just wanna have a little dignity and be able to provide for their families through a job. That's what things like this create. We can never lose sight of that. This is important on so many levels for each one of us, for each one of our chambers, for, for, for networking, for getting to know new friends, new ideas. But at the end of the day, for me personally, I've been here. I know how these employees have struggled the last two years. I've gotten the phone calls. I'm really into this. I'm vested here in this community. And each one of these employees means so much to me. And I'm telling you that when we kicked this off at the announcement, I had employees in the back room, they had tears. They had tears knowing that this convention was coming and they were gonna be working. So I'm really proud of that. I'm also proud of uh, just being part of a network with giants. I consider you all giants. You guys work in your communities. You try to make your community better. We know that small businesses are the engine that run this country. And too often they're disrespected by, you know, nonsense policies out of DC and in our state and locals as well. Because not a lot of people have met payrolls. And when you're in a position to meet a payroll and have people's lives on, on your back, it changes your outlook on what you feel about small business. And so I'm very passionate about these folks. We have people that take their retirement accounts and risk it all for a dream. How can we ever disrespect that and not do everything we can to make sure they're successful? That's my life. That's what I do every day. And I am so honored. It is a privilege to be the president of the Latin Chamber of Commerce in Nevada. It's a privilege to work alongside giants like my brother, Ramiro Cavazos, who I can call him at one in the morning, eight in the morning, whatever. He's always pick up the phone and ask, how can I help you? And that's our model. How can I help you? 
And so that's how this come together. He's got a wonderful staff. We are in such great hands, our future, because of the leadership of our great United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And we are your soldiers. And we will continue to do great things. I will leave you with this. La Nevada is over 36% Latino. I think it's over 40%. You know, a lot of us don't get counted. We're opening up business. We have opened up businesses over the last five years, three times faster than non-Hispanics. We fail at a 60% less rate. We are what makes this country greater. And don't ever, we can never allow anybody to tell us different. This country is not great without us, would fail without us, y pa'lante nos vamos. Gracias. Those are some powerful words spoken by Mr. Peter. Um, I want to introduce our next quick speaker. She is, she has, she's well known in the chamber world, so she doesn't really need extravagant introductions, but she is a powerful woman, Latina. So that is a big deal in this organization. So I really appreciate all her support that she's done for us here at the USHCC with her job at Coca-Cola. She's a senior manager, National Partnerships of Public Policy and Government Affairs. Without further ado, Ms. Hope M. Nice to see you guys. Um, uh, let's register. Boy? Yeah. Well, Bernice Diaz, please tell me the breakfast is still Welcome up. to the Enhancing Hispanic Chamber Board Effectiveness Training. Thank you, Monica, so much for that beautiful introduction. I am very excited to have you all here with us. There are chamber leaders from across the entire country in this room, and it really shows your commitment that you're here bright and early on a Saturday morning in Las Vegas. Um, when we were in Albuquerque, everybody came early to the breakfast, but Las Vegas was a different story. Everybody was late. <laughs> So maybe we should have started even earlier. Um, but so we're a little bit behind in the program. Um, but I wanted to share with you that I am a chamber baby. That's what I call myself. I grew up in the Chamber of Commerce. My mother, Esperanza Porras Field, who's here with us today, founded um, the Morris County Hispanic American Chamber of Commerce, which is composed of 39 towns in New Jersey. And she was also on the United States Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. So this has been my life my it's been a part of my life forever she founded the chamber 32 years ago so i was a young girl i'm not going to tell you how old i was because i don't want you to figure out my age um but it's been a part of my life forever and so this is a training uh that originated in morris county new jersey with our chamber and i thought why don't we bring this to the national level and do it with all the chambers and so i sat with ramiro he loved the idea and this is our third year um, having this training. So it's created for board of directors, presidents, CEOs, and executive directors. And we have a full agenda of excellent training sessions and amazing instructors who are here with us. We're gonna go over high performance leadership, basic consideration and Robert's rules of order, board of governance and chamber bylaws, chamber strategy, creative avenues of revenue, and advocacy and coalition building. The instructors are chamber experts who do this every day and lead their amazing teams across the country. In your binders, you'll find the agenda, uh, their, their uh, bios are in there and copies of the presentations that you can take home with you. Uh, for new chambers, this is perfect because you have a foundation, there's sample bylaws in the binder, so you have a foundation to build your chamber. And for established chambers, this is also very helpful. I think that you're gonna get a lot out of today to really think outside of the box and different way to, to, to do things in different tool sets um, that'll help take your chamber to the next level. I wanna thank Ramiro uh, for putting together this conference and bringing us all together and for our longstanding partnership. Coca-Cola has been a partner since the inception of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce 42 years ago. And we're proud to still partner with you.
And I'd also like to thank his amazing team. Uh, this would not be possible without them. They worked, they've been working really hard. Monica. Fernando. Laura. And Brianna. Thank you so much. You guys have been absolutely amazing. I would also like to thank Peter Guzman. I called him, we had never even met, and now we're like besties. <laughs> We've been talking every day leading up to this conference, and he's been so helpful on the ground here putting everything together. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> I hope that you walk away today with information that's going to help your chamber be more successful. I look forward to getting to know each of you and enjoying the company of my dear friends that I haven't seen in a long time due to COVID. So I'm so happy that we're back together. Thank you. All righty. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started to kick off our training. So we have, we're starting off with high performance leadership mindset. We have a special speaker coming in with us today for the first time. Um, she has 15 years of executive management experience and played an active leadership role in company financial and business processes, improvements, and initiatives. She has a wealth of specialties, especially in the coaching industry. She's a planning facilitator. She knows how to build workshops. And I just spoke to her earlier and a couple of days ago, she was doing her own conference. So she was in my shoes, so she can definitely relate. Um, so to go ahead and kick us off, Ms. Keen Petkovic, who will come on and begin the training. Hi, good morning, everybody. So I don't like podiums, hope you don't mind. So I'm mic'd up. I'm gonna move a little bit around the room. <clears throat> so I'm Kane Petkovic, Kane like candy cane. I always say it that way, even though it sounds a little silly, it helps people remember how to pronounce my name because it's spelled K-E-Y-N-E. -E. And even though uh, we don't have a lot of canes in America, it's, it's a Welsh name. And no, I'm not Welsh, but my mother found the name when she was um, a young woman in a book. It's a, it's a fairy tale. So she liked the name and named it to me. And to this day, I still have not met another cane, K-E-Y-N-E, -E, in America. So maybe someday I will. All right, let's get started. I want to make sure everyone understands what we have in terms of your binders. So before we get into the program... In the area that has bios, you'll see my bio, my contact information is there. And then in the presentation tab, you're going to have a handout on some of the services that we have in our firm. You're going to also have a handout on some of the behavioral profiles that we work with that we'll talk about in a minute. And then there's two tools. There's one that is blank that I'll teach that you can take back to your own staff or the people that you work with. And then there is also a couple pages um, of notes area as well. So if you wanna take the, the note area out, many of the tools that I talk about as a reference, you could write them down and I'm going to be sending them out and I'll make them available to anyone who wants them after the presentation. All right, so does everyone have what they need in their binder? No missing copies, okay. I always like to check because sometimes I know doing these types of, of uh, things, sometimes little things get missed. All right. So <clears throat> a little bit about me. I started off as a therapist and I had no intention initially to be in business, to work as a, as a manager, a lead, an operator. I started off as a therapist. And what I found is that I was working harder than my patients to try to get them on the journey that they were on for their recovery. Can we turn down the mic a little bit? I think this is a little loud, thanks. And so my, um, my medical director at the time said to me, well, let's move you into management because I think that if we don't do something with you, we're gonna lose you. So I ended up getting involved in management and over the years, growing in, you know, becoming a manager, then a director, and then an executive director, COO roles. And what I ended up finding in business is that all of the skills that I had been learning in terms of being a therapist and a counselor, I was applying to the work with my employees. 
I was applying to the work with the teams that I was on and being on executive teams and all of the, the egos and the dramas and the politics and the challenges of working with different personalities and facilitating you know, meetings every day. So what I was finding is that a lot of the tools I had been taught in my initial training, I was applying in my everyday business world. So fast forward, I met David Chavez. Raise your hand if you know David Chavez. He's the founder and owner of Assured Strategy. Okay, so he, he um, has his own history. So he was the executive coach of the company I was working for. And he brought in this whole new strategy mindset to what we were doing in the organization. And it blew my mind that even after, you know, many, many years in senior leadership roles, I didn't understand anything about strategy of an organization because I was in operations. And operations is very different than actually working on the strategy of a company, okay? And a lot of people misunderstand strategy as operational excellence, and that's not strategy. So um, after I left that organization, he heard that I had left and he reached out to me and he said, hey, this is what I'm challenged with. I'm challenged that I'm working with the executive team and there's all of this drama going on that I'm trying to cut through in order to really get true, honest conversations going with the executive team members. And then they're not teaching these things down to their um, at, you know, direct managers and directors consistently because they themselves are struggling with this. What if you came and joined me, we partnered up and we worked on middle management training and leadership and empowerment and helping them get some of the skills they need to become more actively involved in organizations and feel empowered to do their role right? Because as we know, a lot of middle managers, they look to the senior leaders and they want those people to make the decisions and just tell them what to do. And senior leaders are saying, why do I have to be the ones to always, you know, push forward this boulder? I need support. I need help. I need momentum in my organization. So how can we get alignment at the senior level and in the middle management level to really move organizations forward? So, in a million years, I never would have thought starting out in my career that I would be doing coaching, executive business facilitation, um, but here I am. And sometimes as we were talking back at the table, you have to step into the next level, um, not because you definitely want to. No one really, I mean, I didn't wake up saying I want to be a public speaker, but you do it because you're being called to do it. And you know that you're passionate. So I love that we use that word this morning, passion. I'm passionate about what we're doing. So some of the tools that we're going to be talking about today are really around self-awareness and how you as a leader can, can understand that for yourself so that you can help your middle managers, your leaders, your staff that you're working with as well. So hopefully some of the tools today we can pass on because as leaders, that's what we do, right? We challenge ourselves and then we pass on our teaching so that we learn and then as we teach, we learn again, right? So let's get going. In a traditional longer conversation, there's three areas that we're working on in business. We're working on as a leadership, who am I as a leader? Self-awareness, that's like leadership 101 is who am I as a leader? How do I show up? What are my strengths and my weaknesses? What are my blind spots, right? How am I to work with? What baggage from my past am I bringing into my relationships in the business environment? And then we work at, okay, well, how can I work with my team to get the results I need for the organization? Now, we only have an hour today, so we're going to be focusing on the bottom part of the pyramid. But in reality, there's a lot of layers of this where we have to start with ourselves. So <clears throat> we are going to focus on just the bottom, self-awareness, who am I? And there's been a lot out on emotional intelligence in the last 10 years. So raise your hand if you've heard that buzzword, EQ, emotional intelligence, right? When I was first in business, it really wasn't being talked about. This was sort of the therapy area. We don't touch, you know, the soft, touchy, feely stuff, right? But what I think has happened in the last, um, you know, many years is that people have recognized that the number one challenge to getting results in business is what? What's that? Motivating, because who are we working with? People. And what do people bring to the workplace? Their personalities, their own baggage, their own, you know, egos, their own dramas, their own stuff, right? And so it's not, it, it, it's easy for someone to say, I can manage tasks. That's a manager, managing tasks. But how do I lead people? 
that's a whole different skill set. So I think there's been a lot of books out lately on emotional intelligence because we're realizing that it's not a quote unquote soft skill, right? It's actually a hard skill that we have to master if we're gonna get results in an organization. My bias, of course. So we're gonna start with self-regulation. If you don't, I mean, I mean, sorry, uh, self-awareness. If you don't know who you are and how you show up and why you feel what you feel and why you act the way you do, then how in the world are you gonna begin to control yourself, self-regulation, to be able to work with others to get the best results possible? Because you're basically acting blindly as if you have no self-awareness. So what we're working on first, and a lot in, in today's um, conversation is self-awareness that then impacts the ability to regulate yourself. Now, once you've worked on yourself, now you can go and apply it to your team dynamics. Then we have awareness of others. Why do they feel the way they feel? Why um, are they acting the way they're acting? Can we put ourselves in their shoes, right? If we can't put ourselves in someone else's shoes, then we don't really have consciousness in terms of what's driving that individual and then how can we work with them in a more effective way. So if we, we have to work on ourselves in order to put that onto someone else and help understand why they're feeling what they're feeling and thinking what they're thinking. Then we go into regulation of others, meaning in a team dynamic, how can I know what's coming up for me, regulate myself, understand someone else's dynamic, and then act in a way that gets the best results for the team? That's, that's regulation when you're actually able to say, so I'll just use you as an example, Hope, since we met. So Hope, I noticed that you haven't spoken during this, during this session yet, during the meeting, but I can see that you've got something on your face. So what is it that you would like to share that maybe you're not feeling comfortable sharing right now, okay? That's an example of how when you can, can understand what's coming up for you and you, you're paying attention to others, you can bring them in to regulate things to get the results that you want. Make sense? Okay. So, question. What is a vital differential, differential capacity of the human brain? What does the human brain do? It thinks and it creates and it does what in order to be efficient? What's that? Functionality? Part of that. Strategizes? Processes? It gets patterns, it creates links. It creates the links in our brain that, that are the runways that are patterns, right? Those neurotransmitters that, that it's a pattern of how things act in our brain. This is what happens for us because nature finds the easiest way to do things. That's why a river moves around rocks and obstacles. It's finding its easiest path. Those types of things create patterns. So. What does this say? Do I have a volunteer? Can someone read that for me? Okay, good job. So raise your hand if you could read that. Okay, that's pattern recognition because your brain is lazy. Because what does it really say? Now read it, but just read the actual, just, yes, exactly. Right, that's what it really says. But our brain wants to go to what's easy, what's the pattern. So it fills in the gaps to make it make sense for us, okay? That's what happens with our behaviors and how we show up all the time. We are just in our patterns and we're not aware of them because our brain is just in auto, auto operate, okay? So what we talk about is what's called the Johari window. So I wanna mention this little symbol. You see the top symbol on the left up here? If you see that, it means that there's a tool on this. And if you want the tool, feel free to email me and I'll send you the PDF of the tool. Okay, so if you see this little tool symbol, there's more resources. Okay, who has seen the Johari window before? Raise your hand if this is familiar to you. Anybody? Oh, good, a bunch of newbies here. Excellent, I love it. Okay, Johari window. Um, 
two psychologists, John and Harry, that's why they came up with the name Johari window because they both wanted credit for this model. This is a model of self-awareness. So <clears throat> the arena, the open arena, these are things that I know about myself and you know them too, okay? It's called the open arena. I know and you know. Um, so give me something that would be an open arena for me right now that, that I would have shared or something that I know and you know about me. Just so someone has an example. Used to work in a corporate world. Perfect. So now I know that, you know that because it's in the open arena. Okay. Blind spots. Blind spots are things that I don't see about myself, but you see them. So I don't know it about myself, but you see it, okay? That might be something like I might have a hand movement that I'm not aware of that you notice, or I might have an influctuation in my voice that you've noticed that I'm not aware of, um, you know, whatever. So it's something that you notice about me, but I don't see it. It's a blind spot to myself. Okay, now we have the area of mask. Mask is I know this about me, but you don't know it, and I don't want you to know it. It's my vulnerability. It's my thoughts on my weakness. It's my thoughts on the things that I don't really put out there and don't want to share. Okay? So I'll give you an example right now so I can bring it into the open arena. You'll notice that my bio picture looks a little different than how I look now. Okay? I'm going to be a little choked up. So um, I had the, the experience of not only going through COVID this past year, but I also was diagnosed with um, double breast cancer. Whew. So I lost my hair, went through chemotherapy. It's coming back. And every Thank you. Thank you. And so what I realized is that every time I look at my old bio pictures, I feel grief. I feel grief because that's not me anymore. And I need new bio pictures right? So self-awareness around that. So, so that's something that I could say, okay, I knew that about myself. Now you guys know it too. Now it's in which category? It's in the arena, right? Because I've shared something about myself that you wouldn't have automatically known. Now, the unknown is the future potential. This is something in the future that we don't know yet. I don't know my future and you don't know it either. It's, it's the unknown, okay? What we're trying to do in terms of emotional intelligence work is we're trying to open up the arena so that we can stop the politics of me walking around in a mask, pretending to be something I'm not, worried about, you know, showing vulnerability, um, you know, not wanting to be open and honest with my, with my weaknesses. And you can stop the politics of wanting to not upset me by giving me information on my blind spots not wanting to hurt my feelings in business, not wanting to upset the relationship and keeping all what you see about me to yourself, which doesn't allow me the opportunity to grow. It's actually very selfish because if I'm a leader and I want to grow, then what do I need in order to grow? I need the words, I need feedback because otherwise I'm walking around in my blind spots and I'm walking around in my masks and we don't actually have vulnerability and openness and dialogue and community as leaders together. And then when we expand that potential of the open arena, then what happens when, when teams are really close and there's true synergy? Does it expand the potential? Yes, so it expands the unknown, right? Now I can have one plus one equals 10. One plus one equals a thousand. Instead of everyone in, in, in our teams worrying about the politics of not wanting to hurt someone's feelings, not wanting to upset someone, you know, trying to um, be politically correct about giving feedback and, and sharing things with each other. And then all of us worrying about our egos and how we are coming across and, you know, is someone going to like me or not? So the whole work that we do is trying to drive this quadrant into the arena. Make sense? Okay, any questions on this before I move on? Yes. Why is it possible to help more 
wanting to know yourself. Why would that happen? I love your question. So Marcos is saying, doesn't it need, doesn't someone need to want to do this in order to do it? So what's the answer, guys? Yes. And why would someone want to do this? Okay, because they are a what? And a, and a leader, and a leader. So absolutely, what I find is that, is that when people aren't willing to engage in the vulnerability and the hard work and the honest conversations. Um, usually it's based on fear. So you gotta get into the what's the fear about. Uh, and you work with them for a while. And if they're still not fundamentally on board with being a part of a team that really wants to grow together and learn together and expand together, then they're probably not in the right culture. Because we can't motivate people. They have to have that motivation within themselves. I can provide the tool and the framework and the context for change, but I can't do that change for them. So great, great question. We can't always bring everyone on the ride. Have you ever worked with an individual who you tried to mentor and coach for a while and they just wouldn't be on the ride and they chose to get off the ride, right? It happens. Okay, <clears throat> raise your hand if you use any kind of behavior profiling in your organizations, you've had them done. Just give me a, a show of hands of who's actually used these type of tools. Okay, did you use them, those that raised your hand, and are they actively a part of your culture, or was it an interesting exercise and they went in a drawer and you didn't really visit them again? Second one, second one, second one. Okay, that's what my first experience was, even in, in the mental health arena with, with profiles. So what I found is that we did, we did profiles, the, the one that our organization chose was DISC, so raise your hand if you're familiar with DISC. Okay. So we did DISC, it was an interesting executive retreat. We all sort of had a little kumbaya about ourselves. Um, and then the report went into the drawer and it never was talked about again at all. Total waste of time. Fast forward, I'm working with David Chavez and he's facilitating our executive retreat and we're doing profiles again. And he, he brought up three profiles and I'm gonna talk about them. And what ended up happening that was different is that we used it every single meeting. We brought it out. We had cards about it. We talked about it. We used it to facilitate um, coaching and conversations with our employees. We used it for um, looking at who we're going to hire, what kind of profile fits the job that we're hiring for. And it became a part of the culture of the company. And then the power was amazing. And I saw the difference between an interesting exercise that went in a drawer and something that actually became powerful. So a fool with a tool it's still a fool, right? So these tools are tools. If you're not going to use them, don't waste your time and don't waste your money. But if you are going to use a tool, then you need to know how to use it to make it alive in your organization to get the power of your investment. That's ROI. You want the power of your investment. Okay, so we at Assured Strategy, we use three tools. We use DISC. DISC, um, I've been certified in a couple different types of profiles. And obviously as a therapist, I'm familiar with site testing and et cetera. I really find that DISC is very helpful and I find that it's actually a foundation of a lot of fad type of profiles. What color are you? What dog are you? You know, what animal type? I mean, there's all sorts of things out there, a culture index. There's a lot of different things at the root of many of them is really DISC. Um, this is, DISC is about how you behave. How you behave when you're comfortable and relaxed and in your own environment. That's called your natural style. And how you behave when you're in public or in an uncomfortable environment or you're thinking people need something from you or want something from you and you're not quite sure if your natural style is what's called for or not. So there's two different types of behavior patterns. And the reason that it's represented by the buoy at the top, so I'll go back a second just to keep you focused. A buoy at the top is because behaviorally as human beings, we have a lot of flexibility in our behaviors. We're adaptable. So you can put me in this environment and I'll show up a certain way. And you put me out there in the casinos and, you know, in the evening, I might be showing up a little different way, right? So we as human beings are adaptable. That's why it's a buoy because um, there's a lot of movement with our behavior patterns. All right, the next one that we use is called the values index. The values index, there's seven value drivers and it's based upon um, some work that came out of World War II. Um, and basically it looks at what drives and motivates me to show up the way I show up, to care about what I care about. 
We're not gonna get into the values today. We don't have time for that. But it's things like, am I motivated by ROI? Do I have a little calculator in my brain that says, if I'm gonna volunteer between two organizations, which one is gonna get the bigger bang for my time, energy, and the investment and my resources? A little ROI brain, okay, that, that's high economic. Doesn't have to be about money, but it's about you evaluate things through what's going to be the return of the investment on my time, energy, and resources. Then there's another one. It could be high theoretical. High theoretical individuals, they love to learn for learning's sake. They don't need a reason to learn it. They don't need the, the application of the learning. They have a curiosity to know why the world works the way it does and why things are connected. And so they're your favorite Googlers, right? They're, they're Googling ideas and they go down rabbit channels of various topics just because of the pure love of learning. So someone who's low theoretical, it doesn't mean they can't learn or that they're not smart. It just means they're most likely gonna learn and apply it. Whereas high theoretical, they're going to just do it because they love it. It fills, it fills a desire in them. So anyways, there's seven value drivers. And when you know what your value drivers are, meaning you care about it more than the average person, then you know why you show up looking different than the person next to you. So if someone's high aesthetic and they love form, beauty, harmony, balance, feng shui, aesthetics, color, right? If I give, give them um, a tool that I need some feedback on, they're going to give me feedback on color, layout, you know, what was the experience using it? If I give that same tool to someone who's low in that area, low aesthetic, they're going to be giving me feedback maybe on the text. You know, am I missing any commas? What's my grammar errors? Because their brain isn't really valuing necessarily as a higher priority that aesthetic. So there's no right, wrong, good or bad. We all have different value drivers. But when we're working together with, with employees and teams, it's important to know what the value drivers are of the individual because then I can understand why they are coming at a conversation from the perspective that they have. It just gives the team knowledge. Okay, the last one, um, and we're not gonna do this one either, is the attribute index. The attribute index tells us how we think and process information subconsciously. Because where is most of the work of our brain being done? Most of the work of the brain is being done where? Subconscious. Right? Very little is actually being done on a conscious level. So I want to know, am I working with an individual who has really high people, people skills where they intuitively understand people? Or am I working with an individual who intuitively grasps the here and the now, concrete thinking, black and white ideas, problem solving, project implementation, that that part for them is crystal clear? Or am I working with someone who understands the big picture? who can see the connections being made, who don't need to talk about how something applies to the larger context of ideas and what's going on in the organization. Because sometimes we're sitting in an executive meeting and someone asks the question, well, how does this apply to our, our next year's plan, right? They might be low in a certain area of that. And the other person is sitting there going, why are we talking about this? Isn't it obvious? This is a waste of our time. Right? We have these thoughts. I've had these thoughts. I still have these thoughts, right? So the point is that when you know your teammates, when you know how they're thinking and processing information as, as a talent, then I can have understanding and grace for their questions because they might not grasp everything in a certain dimension of information the same way I do. And it's not right, wrong, good, or bad. We just have different, different strengths. Okay. So I want to spend a couple minutes on, on this piece because I want to talk about this in the context of delegation. So I'm going to do this in a little different angle. Some of you know this, some of you don't, but I want to do this in the context of delegation because this is one of the topics that for many leaders, we have a hard time delegating for various reasons. So high Ds. D is based upon problem solving. How you tend to go um, approach problems that are new and different, not problems you know the typical outcome of, okay? This is problems that are new and different. My high Ds, they're jumping off before they even have all the details. They're climbing up that mountain just as soon as you said, we're gonna climb this mount, they're already out the door, they're gone. They're driving, they're forceful, they're demanding, they're visionary, they get the big picture. They get excited and passionate about where we're going, right? They don't really wanna deal with so much of the details. So raise your hand if you feel that, that there's a part of you that's a high D, that you're really big picture thinking, driving, determined, assertive, 
right? Vocal about stuff. Okay. High Ds make decisions and they don't need all the facts because if it's right or wrong, they don't care. They'll just pin it. They don't have the fear that holds them back from fast decision makings in arenas where they um, are not so comfortable, okay? If someone's a low D, they don't want to make a quick decision because they might make a mistake and they don't want to make mistakes. And so they slow down the decision making process to gather what? Information, okay? So high Ds, driven. Now, the pros of the high Ds is that there are visionaries. They're drivers. They cut through red tape. They go around boulders. You're either on my team or you're in my way. Like we're getting up, up to this mountain with or without you, right? They move. But sometimes they do what to people? Ruffle feathers, hurt feelings, come across as being too much of a B or an A, right? Okay. So high Ds with delegation. Um, they sometimes assume that they've communicated the vision. And so they don't slow down enough to actually give the details and communicate the vision of what they want. And then they get frustrated when they don't get the outcome they thought they were going to get. Okay. So what we're doing with, with our high Ds is we're having them understand if you want the outcome, you have to go through the pain of slowing down to be clear about the vision. Because what I, what I know with my high Ds is that it's real. It's already achieved. They can see it, taste it, smell it, hear it. They're already on the, on, the, on the tip of the peak. They already see the vista. It's alive in their mind. And so they don't understand that the, that the person sometimes they're talking to doesn't understand what's really already so crystal clear in their mind. And so they need to slow down and give more information if they wanna get results, okay? So just a little tip for your high Ds in terms of your delegating. But high Ds in businesses, they're innovators, they're decision makers, they're movers and shakers and they get SHIT done. Okay, if we don't have high Ds on a team, what happens to the team? Stagnates. Analysis paralysis. Talking about the same problem 10 times, right? So high Ds have a place, but, but they need self-awareness that sometimes they're coming across in a way that's not helping the team get results because of their natural style. So there's no good, bad, right, or wrong. You just have to have self-awareness. So you can regulate your behaviors to get the results that you want. Okay, high eyes. High eyes, they're interactive. Okay, they really value being with people. People and relationships is what drives them. So what we're doing with our high eyes is they sometimes are overly optimistic. And because they like people, they um, give you the benefit of the doubt. They don't want to hurt your feelings. They want to have a good relationship with you. Sometimes they have challenges with delegation because they don't circle back around and dot the I and cross the T because they've gone on to the next exciting you know, thing. Or they don't want to hurt your feelings and come across as being you know, too bossy like the other people, right? Like the other types. And so they don't want to actually hold you accountable, okay? So delegation for high eyes is sometimes challenging because they, their strength is people, and then sometimes that's a blind spot for them too, okay? So high eyes, they inspire us, motivate us, communicate, um, and, and we work with them with coaching. So I need high eyes on my team because I want to use that passion and that energy of my high eyes to help get things done in the organization, to be my cheerleaders to be able to communicate with the masses, to be able to um, you know, bring that excitement and that positivity and that relationship building to the team. But if they do that too much, they become un, starts the P, unproductive. So they have a blind spot at some times there too, right? Everything that's a strength can also be a blind spot. Okay, high S's. S's is about the pace of the environment you prefer to have. Do you like to have a really slow and predictable pace? That's a high S. They like routine, consistency. They're loyal. They're dependable. Um, they, they stay with a lot of longevity in organizations and companies. They're the ones that show up every day and, and steadily do the work. Or is someone a low S, meaning they like change. And if things get too boring, what do they do? They'll make change just because they're bored. 
right? They just, you know, sometimes I call it like a, like a little whirlwind behind them. They're just moving through and they're creating a little chaos behind them at times because they just love the mix. Whereas my high S's, they like it slow and predictable and passive and they like routine and stability. They're very team focused. Um, you know, they're harmonious. They, they have a hard time with someone who's sort of mixing things up just for the sake of mixing things up. You know, why are we doing this? They ask a lot of why questions. What's the purpose of the change? Why are we doing this? So when I was first working in, in um, leadership management, because <clears throat> those are two different things. So I wasn't, I think, a leader yet. I was still a manager. And I didn't know anything about this, this uh, stuff. I was always frustrated on my teams with my staff in my department regarding why certain people always wanted to ask questions and why couldn't they just get on board and why were they being Debbie Downers and why were they like, you know, not excited about this new idea that I was bringing forward. And they used to annoy me. I mean, I'll be honest. <clears throat> so then I learned about, about, about um, DISC and I learned that once they understand the why and they have time to get on board, they actually become my change agents because they wanna to get to a new predictable norm. They wanna to get to the new routine. And if they understand the why behind it, then they're on board to make it happen. Whereas my high Ds are off in another direction. My high I's have gone off in a different direction. My S's are the ones that now make my new the norm. And so I learned the power of working with my S's, my, my high S's. Because again, no, no good, bad, right, or wrong. They all have strengths and they all have potential blind spots. So high S is reliable, dependable, team focused, and they're change agents when you use them effectively and don't see them as resisting change initially. So you got to use them and harness them towards change. But they do ask a lot of questions. So, okay, high C's. High C's. These types of individuals care about quality, detail, precision accuracy, perfection, things being done right by their definition of right, okay? When I have conflict between two high C's, it's usually because they disagree on what right equals. And when I can get them to talk about what does right mean for you and what does right mean for you and we can get to what the definition of right is, they're often running together because they both want quality but they will get stubborn and fight for what they think is right because they know the details, they know the facts, and they're bringing that knowledge to the conversation. So unless they trust your opinion based on your facts and figures that they might have missed, they're going to stick to their own, right? Because they've done the research. So they don't like to talk to people who just have an opinion that's willy-nilly, loosey-goosey, you know, without any kind of facts to back up how they got their opinion. Okay, so they can challenge us, and it's not that they're challenging us to be obstinate, they're challenging us because they want to know our thinking, and they want to be able to trust our thinking. And so in a lot of different ways, like high C's have a problem with delegation, because sometimes they think, oh, it's, it's easier for me to do it than to teach someone how to do it right. Does that resonate with anybody? It's just easier for me to do it. So <clears throat> sometimes we have, we have challenges there. Now, high C's. Logical, rational, organized, and pros and cons conversations. They love the pros and cons conversations, making the list, you know, if we do different options. So when I'm doing, when I'm doing a planning, I want to make sure that my high D is matched with the high C. Why do I want my high D sometimes matched with the high C? The visionary and then the reality check, right? The visionary gets driven nuts, nuts by the reality check but they need each other's strengths to counteract each other's weaknesses inherently in an organization. So we have to value each other's differences instead of seeing it as they're not like me, therefore they're not you know, someone I'm comfortable with. So it's really about diversity here. So here's a quick example, and then we're gonna move on. So this was someone I was working with, um, a facilities director. He was assertive, direct in his communication. Look at his D right? High D. And the adaption is the gray. He just goes down a little bit when someone's eyes are on him. He's pretty much a high D regardless, natural or adaptive. He was either really social, that's his eye, his yellow was high, or he clammed up when he was under pressure. When he had things that were re um, expected of him, or he felt stressed about a situation, he clammed up. He would go into his office and shut down 
socially. And everyone would wonder what's wrong with this person, you know, because normally they're outgoing and talkative and communicative. And his S, his S is low. That's the green. He adapts even down further. So when pressure is on him, he was creating chaos in, in the system. And, and he was changing pr processes just because he felt this desire to change things up. And the line staff were saying, why are we changing? It's, it's perfectly fine. So he was creating some, some messes in his, in his department because of his S and his C. He was definitely wanting things to be done right by his definition of right. And he wanted it done his way. And his way was always the right way. Now, you see how people's profiles, we are a little bit of every single one of these four areas. It's not one or the other. We are a little bit of everything. It's just to what degree. So when I was working and coaching with this individual, what are the two areas that I had to help him with the most? What are his two highs? D and C, because he had an internal battle going on all the time between I want it fast and I want it perfect. I want it fast and I want it perfect. Okay, and then sometimes, because both of those stay high in his adaptive state, his eye was dropping and then he wasn't talking about it. He wasn't communicating. He wasn't actually leading his, his people. So this is an example with, with profiles where I can use this material to give him self-awareness about how he's showing up in his blind spots. And he can let down his masks of vulnerability so that I can help him see that it's not good or bad, right or wrong. No profile is good or bad, right or wrong. Every profile has strengths and every profile has some inherent weaknesses. And it's about self-awareness of when am I in my weakness so I can get back into my zone of strength, okay? Because do we want someone who is a high D and a driver to lose that in an organization? No, but do they need to also be aware that sometimes the way that they're trying to get that vision met is causing issues. Yeah. So it's not that you want to give up the strength of your profile, but you have to have the self-awareness around it. Okay. That's what we have time for there. So again, an example of how we're trying to expand the arena to minimize his blind spots and have him open up and get more vulnerable about his mass so we can um, increase his leadership potential with his team. Okay. So what happens when we give people feedback? on a blind spot. What's the natural thing that happens as human beings? We get defensive. We get defensive. And so don't expect not to have a defensive reaction from your people or from yourself. You're going to get, have that because it's, it's the, uh, the person's way of protecting their ego. It's ego protection, which ego is not a bad thing all the time. For you to be in this room right now means you are coming with some sense of ego. Ego can be power. It can be empowerment. It can be the thought that I can make a difference. Ego is the ability to show up and do what you need to do to get done because you want to make a difference in your areas. It takes ego to show up and do that, right? But when we get feedback sometimes of our blind spots, our defensiveness, our defensiveness comes up. It's a natural human reaction. So people can deny what you're telling them is true. Okay, that I, I disagree that that's wrong. I, I don't do that. Okay, feedback is feedback. Just say thank you. You don't have to agree. It's just, it's just feedback. Indifference means I hear you, but I really don't give a you know what, right? Whatever, okay? Minimization, I hear you, but it's not as bad as what you're telling me, okay? I'll take a little bit of what your feedback is, but not all of it because, you know, I, I'm just gonna minimize the message. Rationalization or justification. This one is done a lot by a lot of intelligent people. We use data, facts, details to explain our way out of the situation of the feedback, okay? Then we also have projection. Projection is where we are pointing the finger at somebody else and blaming it on someone else. Well, if that person would have done such and such, I could have done my part. Or um, it's this person who really is, is at fault, not me. Okay, we, we don't hear the message of the feedback for our blind spot because we're projecting the issue onto someone else or blaming it on someone else in terms of the rationalization. So projection and rationalization are very similar. One is re really more about logic. Projection is more about involving somebody else or something else. Okay, self-pity. Sometimes we go into self-pity mode. We get a little bit of feedback and we're like, oh my gosh, I suck. I can't do anything right. Everything I do seems to be wrong, okay? We go into self-pity mode, or you've worked with employees who go into self-pity mode. 
And then what does that do? We try to back up the message and make it softer so that they don't feel so bad about the message instead of holding true to the blind spot that we're trying to communicate. And then the last one is strong emotions, either anger or tears. Um, ever have anyone cry in your office when you talk to them and you're trying to give them feedback and they like have this big breakdown or, or really aggressive anger you know, response? It's, it's a protection, it's a protection. So we need to expect this in others and we need to expect this in ourselves. So let's go into self-awareness. What does it feel like inside your body physically when you notice you're getting defensive? Who wants to share? Anyone aware of what that feels like for them? Frustrated. What's that? Frustrated. Okay, you're frustrated. Anger. Anger. And is there anything happening in your nervous system or like in the physical aspect of your body? Yeah. Tension. Anything else? Heat rising. Anything else? People can get rashes, right? Absolutely. Right, our tone changes, our stomach might start to go a little bit, we get tense, or we might sit back with our arms crossed. F you, this is not happening, I'm, I'm not taking this in, right? Ooh, yes. We're already back, we're already getting ready for our defensive response, okay? So when you have self-awareness that you're being defensive, then you can say to yourself, okay, I'm feeling defensive, it's normal. I'm gonna acknowledge my defensiveness. So I, I might say, you know, I'm, I'm trying to stay present in our conversation, but I'm getting really defensive right now. So let me just own what's happening for me so that we can move past it. Now, what a breath of fresh air that would be for you, where I'm owning my own SHIT. You don't have to manage me. I'm doing it myself because I've got self-regulation and self-awareness around it, right? Or if I'm not aware, you could say, I'm, I'm seeing you getting defensive, Kane. What's going on for you? Right? Let's get past the defensiveness. How are you stuck? So that we can have the conversation as leaders, because that's what we do. Leaders lead people. Leaders inspire people. We have to know our people skills. Okay, so then you give someone feedback, and then they go, and they feel what? They feel like they are a hmm? failure, yes, and it starts with a V. They are a victim, okay? So we go and we give people feedback. Now they say that they're a victim, right? That's the defensive piece we're dealing with with them. And then who do they want? Um, like, what, what's going on for them in terms of pointing the finger? What do they need? They need someone to blame. So they, they find a persecutor, okay? Persecutor is doing it to them. It's not justified. I'm the victim here. It's not fair. Someone's persecuting me, okay? Then they go and they, and they run and they find someone else to do what for them? To empathize, right? Um, because they need to find a rescuer to make them feel like they're, they have justification for their victim mindset. This is called the drama triangle, okay? So the drama triangle is basically that in all interactions, when we don't have awareness, we're playing on these triangle pieces all the time. So I might be in a victim position in one minute, and then I might be in a persecutor um, position in another minute, because persecutor energy is, is, is this, it's, it's finger pointing, blame, shame, judgment, condemnation, right? It's this energy of you're not okay, I know better. That's persecutor energy. Victim energy is, woe is me, it's not fair, I'm, I'm a victim of the circumstance, okay? And rescuer energy is, oh, but I can help you, I can solve your problem, I can make you feel better, because it makes rescuers feel good to be helpful, right? So sometimes in our culture, we actually teach people to become rescuers, and it's actually not the psychology we want within our dynamics. So... In our family systems growing up, there's usually one or two of these areas that we are most comfortable in because we played there a lot, okay? But we all move throughout these all the time. So a little story um, about David Chavez. You can tell him, Peter. You can tell him we were talking about the drama triangle. And the first time I brought the drama triangle to, to David and the firm, you know, because we use this a lot, obviously, He's like, oh, I'm not a victim. Like, I, I, I don't sit in that thing. He's a high D, right? 
It's like, I'm not a victim. I, I, I don't sit there. And then he was driving. And what do you think a high D who gets cut off feels or reacts? What do you think they say when they, expletives? That person, that beep beep, did that to me, right? And then his light bulb went off in his head and he's like, oh my God, I am playing the victim. This is being done to me, it's personal. It's not fair, it's not right, I'm the victim. So sometimes these things are very subtle where we don't have an obvious connection to some of these different um, roles, but we actually all play the roles. Now, let's talk about male psychology for a second. Um, what, what is important to, and this can be for women too, so I don't wanna genderize this, but I'm just gonna say this to the guys. What are you taught sometimes growing up that is your role as a man? What's that? To protect. to protect. And then where would protector fall on here? The rescuer. The rescuer. Yeah. Saving, the saving the day, saving the damsel in distress, saving the situation, right? Heroine um, or, or hero, right? It can be both male or female, but we're taught that, it's, that we're coming in to rescue, okay? Um, but sometimes when we get consciousness of when we're doing it, we have to ask ourselves, am I helping this person? Am I powering this person? Or am I solving it for them because it makes me feel good? Yes. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I will want to address that. So men and women can both be rescuers, but what I wanted to do was have the men associate that the hero complex, the hero idea is actually of the rescuer seat because we as women are there a lot, right? Um, but sometimes men don't identify that, that they come in as the rescuer. So it's important for me in the room to make sure that they see that they can sit on that seat too. Because it's very common. No, there, there's no problem. <laughs> But okay, so as high Ds, where do you sometimes get, get um, slotted by other people? Persecutor, right? High Ds sometimes get slotted as persecutors because they wanna get things done. Okay, so now this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to teach ourselves and our employees that, that the victim needs to go to the creator mindset. Meaning you are the creator of your reality. You are empowered to be a co-creator of the reality that you want. You're not a victim of circumstances, okay? So I'm not a victim of cancer. I can choose my experience. I can choose my reality. I can choose how I show up for my family. I can choose to still work full time during treatment. I can choose to show the freaking, freaking knock and doing it up, right? That's my choice, okay? That's the creator mindset. That's the creator mindset. Or I can sit in my room and cry and feel sorry for myself, okay? That's my choice. Now, persecutors don't always have to be people. It could be a thing. I could be persecuting my disease. I could be saying that was done to me. So it's not always a person that sits in that persecutor role. It could be a life circumstance as well, okay? And what we're trying to have the persecutor move is to the challenger, meaning I'm gonna challenge you to step up and be your best version of you because I believe in you. I'm not blaming, shaming, pointing the finger down at you. I'm not judging you, but I'm saying I believe in you and you need this feedback to show up your best self. And I'm willing to have you be a little upset with me right now because I know that this is going to help you take yourself to the next level. And so at some point, I will hope you'll come back and thank me for that honesty because I believe in you more than I want to stay comfortable. Okay, I believe in you more than I want to just be, you know, complacent and, and, and keep it safe in, in our relationship but you're not in the judging mode. That's the difference. It's the energy of belief in them. That's challenger versus judging mode. That's persecutor, okay? And then we want the rescuer to coach. The rescuer needs to show up and say, listen, you are empowered to fix this yourself. I'm here to support you. I'm here to listen to you. But at the end of the day, I'm not solving it for you. You're going to go out there and solve it for yourself, but I will support you along that way. Okay, that's the coaching mindset versus the rescuing mindset. And as leaders, we need to understand the difference between rescuing our employees or rescuing our, uh, our relationships and being a coach, right? So does that resonate? I love your questions. Okay, 
Couple tools, uh, we're not gonna do them together, but I wanna teach you how you can take these tools home and use them for yourself and we use them for the, the people that you're working with. Yes. How would you apply the system if that process is actually justified? Because there is actually a victim, because there is actually a problem, because there is actually something that is actually not in mind by the organization. Okay, so all we're trying to do is, is, not, is not have that person feel like it's being done to them and woe is me, sorry is me. What we're trying to do is have that person say, I'm empowered to help create the reality, the solution. It's just the energy of the situation. Can you apply it to a case where actually there is a problem and there is something in mind? Oh yeah, I can apply it to a situation I just ran into myself. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's digress uh, back for a second. Okay, so... Um, so, true story. We're a small firm. We have a marketing coordinator who is, um, you know, trying to turn over material. And I came in not consciously, right? So this is not conscious. This is unconscious, unintentionally, as the rescuer. And I said to her, listen, I know we're trying to get things turned over. You can get this to me nights, weekends, whenever, and I'm willing to get you feedback so we can keep things moving along. I'm, I'm a business partner. I have, you know, responsibility for action in the organization and accountability to, to move the organization forward. And I thought I was doing a good thing, right? I thought I was putting in my, my hard work and effort, okay? So um, long story short, she leaves. We get a new marketing coordinator. And in the transition, that marketing coordinator explains, oh, this is how Kane works. This is what you need to do. You just send it to her whenever you, you got it done and she'll make it happen. And so David finds out that this is the expectation. And then when he's not responding the same way, he's getting persecuted as not being helpful and blah, blah, blah. And so he comes and he says to me, you know, Kane, you set this, this situation up where it's not helping the company. And immediately my defensiveness went up and inside myself, inside my chest, we were on the phone. And immediately I want to say, F you. Here I am sacrificing. Here I am doing what I need to do for this organization. And, and you're not even a valid, like appreciating my efforts, right? I went into victim mode. Um, and, he, and then immediately in that conversation, I said to myself, okay, but what I've actually done is hurt the company because I've not set expectations that are healthy for any of us. And I need to switch my mindset to say, you know, you're right. Because if I had talked with him about it and it was a strategic decision to have that in the short term for a specific outcome, or we decided even for a few years, that's how we were going to work, then that would have been a strategic decision around that. But I had just done it myself. And then I got defensive when it was challenged because it wasn't actually a strategic decision for the organization because it set up a pattern of behavior in the company that wasn't a healthy dynamic. Okay. So that's an example of where, where it, it's a problem that needs to get solved on the surface. You know, people can take different perspectives, but it's like how, you, how you're coming at it. Was that helpful? Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so enjoyment competency matrix, another tool symbol. So, and the drama triangle is a tool as well. So what this is, is as leaders, often we come from situations where we are doers. Doers do, right? And we have a hard time delegating because of fear, ego, power, and control. And so what we do is this exercise. So I want you to write down in your notes the steps of this exercise because you can take it home and you can use it. So don't show people the model until they've done the first part of it. This is a two-part piece here, okay? So part one is have your employees or yourself write down the top 10 tasks that they do in their role, the function of their job. Top 10 tasks, okay, that's step number one. Then they're gonna plot it into this matrix. So you have a blank matrix in your handout. They would plot it into the matrix and they would ask themselves, this task, do I feel that I'm an expert at it? Am I competent? Do I have some knowledge or am I really not capable of doing this task? It's really hard for me, I don't understand it, I'm not very good at it. And they'll plot it against, do I loathe it? tolerate it, like it, or love it. Because what ends up happening is as leaders, we have energy sucks in activities that we do that really and truly suck down our energy and don't give us the energy to do what we need to do for our organizations. And sometimes we're doing things just because it's always been done that way. So you plot it. Now, 
you might have two in one box and you might have known no you know in several boxes there's no you don't have to put one task per box you just stick them in the boxes that it applies and then you take your next page your model and you apply it to the conversation so the tasks that are in load and tolerate and you really aren't very good at them those are things that you should be avoiding Okay, because their energy sucks, they're drains for you, they're not going to help you in terms of your leadership mindset. If you um, are an expert at it, and you don't like it, you should be delegating that out. That's an area where you have knowledge, but it's not something that fills your well, you should be delegating those out. If you're tolerating certain things, and you do have some knowledge, keep to a minimum or oversee other individuals who are who are going to be doing it with you. And then your like and love and if you're expert at it that's your strength that's your passion that's your mojo that's that's what you need to be mentoring and teaching and sharing in your organizations because that fills your well okay and you're and you're very good at it and then down here if you're you know thinking that you like it and love it but you're not very capable then that's your growth curve that's your um, area that you can expand yourself as you're on your own continued um, journey there. Okay. So don't give your employees the results first, or it's going to bias where they put the items in, in the box. But after they, they write their tasks, their 10 tasks, and they put it in, into the matrix, then you can bring out this and you can have great conversations. Because what's happened is I have found one employee hating something and another employee loves it. Okay, well, here's an opportunity for some cross pollination, some cross sharing, some cross training, cross teaching. Or I've had another person who was in middle management and, and, and they had a task in quality that they loved. And I said, well, what are you doing to be the spokesperson in your organization for championing quality? How can we actually take your passion and implement it in a larger scale in our organization? Because it's something that you should be passing along. So that's how, how this matrix um, works. Okay, so in terms of um, asking your employees and yourself, I know I'm on time here, I've got one minute. Fear, ego, power, and control. These are the four things you have to ask yourself. What am I fearful of if I delegate? Am I fearful that an employee might make a mistake and it might impact my ego, how I'm perceived, my reputation, right? Um, do I have um, fear around the quality not being good enough? And so I don't want to delegate because I, I want it done right. You know, how do we keep, um, how are we fearful about power uh, dynamics? How are we fearful about keeping things in control? So in terms of a leadership mindset, we have to always evaluate, are we coming from a place of fear, ego, power, and control? Or are we coming from a place from empowerment and supporting and mentoring and coaching down? So, so these four areas come up a lot in, in coaching. Okay, the last thing I wanna touch upon, stress triggers. So you have this handout in here. We have gone through a pretty serious um, situation, and I can tell you that um, I don't know the exact statistics, but I just heard in the conference I was at um, the last two days that CEO's rate of depression and suicide is, is spiked. It's on the climb. So what I wanted to do in my last comments here before I wrap up is to say that, that this tool is used to help us figure out where are my triggers what are the things that are unconscious to me that I need to make conscious? Okay, so for example, I just shared one today that I saw a picture, right? I saw a picture of myself and it brought up what for me? Emotion, right? And the story in my head is a negative story, okay? So now I could go onto this and I could say, okay, so that image, that, that would fit in the category of image. When I see this image, I have a negative reaction. I have a negative message that I'm telling myself. So what can I do to change into the positive framework? Well, maybe I need to actually go and get some new bio shots and own it and claim it and just move on, right? Maybe that's what needs to happen. Or cell phones. How many of you have a physiological reaction when you get an email or a beep on your phone? Okay, very, very common. If I hear that phone in the middle of the night, I immediately feel stressed. Like I have to look at that email. It might be something and then I'm already in, in work mode. So now I just keep it on silent all night long, right? Because I know that that's a negative um, association for me. There's a negative uh, 
thing that happens within me when I hear the sound of a certain type of notification. So I got to do something different. So you can think about this for yourself. You can take this home and you can use it for yourself to say, how can I get consciousness of what's unconscious to be able to help put in positive um, ideas and positive thoughts, images, um, and messages in order to counteract some of our patterns of negative thinking and negative consciousness, okay? So that's our time. Um, by increasing self-awareness, we increase our leadership performance. And um, we focused again on the self, who am I as a leader? There's other areas here, so feel free to reach out. Final questions before I pass the, pass the mic. I know we've got other speakers, yes. Oh, I meant three if I, if I said four. Okay. Disc values and attributes, correct. And we call it advanced insights. And, um, and so those three come together, it ends up being 71 pages, but technically they're three separate distinct profiles, but we use them in combination because leaders need to know their behaviors, what drives them, and then how they process information as a talent. Any other questions? Yes. 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 And, and taking those, those physical, the, the smell, the taste, the touch, the ear, and reprogramming that. And then it, in some case, you may not get angry. Yes. It's, you know, to go in there. So I'm really, really good. Yes, that's, it, that's exactly that. Cognitive behavior therapies from that too. You, but you, what we're trying to do with that is reprogram our patterns. Right. Because those synapses have been formed. And we're trying to shift from, from a negative train into a positive train. Do you, do you agree a lot they talk about as a change of physical, like get up and yes. move around, that, 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 that physical movement changes the, 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 the snaps in the brain, the electronic and focus, and creates new, new ones to help with reprogramming? Yes. And that's why EMDR, if anyone's familiar with that, it's, it's when you stimulate the right and the left hemisphere, during talk therapy, it de-escalates trauma memories and puts them into more of the information memory versus the, um, the, the limbic system memory, which is fight, flight, or freeze. And so that, that's what's happening. You use movement in, in that therapy. Yeah, so that's, that's a great comment. Okay, I'm very sensitive to time. We have more questions? Yes. Oh, I love that question. So um, someone who's a high I doesn't all of a sudden become a low I. Someone who's a low I doesn't all of a sudden become a high I. But over, over a five-year period, we can see some variations in profiles where maybe someone that was a 99D is now an 87. Or someone who was like a 56D is me, I might move up to a 75. Because the environments that we're in change what we sort of adapt to. So if I take it, you know, in this one environment and then I take it in a different environment, I might see some fluctuations, but I'm not fundamentally going to show up a totally different person. So, you know, given that we're hopefully not Mm-hmm. Yes. People can take it within like three to five years. Values are more like a seven-year change. So how you start off in the beginning of your career is going to look different at the end of your career. But this can have a shorter time period. Um, so absolutely. But, but really, it's about the self-awareness. It's, it's not as important to know the exact number as it is to know how you show up. Um, because people can get self-aware, but they don't fundamentally change their personalities. Yeah. Yeah. Great questions. Okay. Um, I think that... Yes, one more. Now from the perspective of a leader. Yes. Um, so the objective of the leader is to challenge um, the profiles to make, for example, the C um, become C high? No. No. Great question. The thing about self-awareness, you're not trying to change your profile. You're not trying to change who you, who you are. What you're trying to do is get consciousness when your behavior pattern is helping you be successful First, when the same behavior is in your own way, it's become a stuck, okay? So for example, if I'm a higher I, yeah, we need, to, we need to move on. If I'm a higher I and I'm on a project and we're not getting traction, it might be because I'm not holding my staff accountable. So I get consciousness and then I can get more, more aware of my behavior. It's a great question. All right, guys, really, I appreciate your time. And uh, you can feel free to reach out to me for tools.
how to do so. Thank you so much, Keen, for some great tips. So that was a great presentation, wasn't it, guys? Moving on to our next presenter, we're going to be talking about board governance and chamber bylaws. So this is some great information for our new chamber leaders. Coming on board to speak for us is another great, strong, powerful Latina who has been the legal counsel for the Latin Chamber of Commerce of Nevada for the last five years. Uh, Ms. Carmen Avelo has been licensed to practice law in Nevada since 2000 and has an extent in extensive professional experience with all ranges of businesses, including multi-state corporations, not-for-profits, and LLCs. So if any, without further ado, please go ahead and welcome Ms. Carmen, Carmen Avelo. Good morning, everybody. So I don't like to speak to people. I like to speak with people. So I encourage you to be interactive. As I'm speaking, stop me, ask questions in real time. Um, give me some examples. Uh, talk about what's going on with your organization. So I will start by asking all of you, how many chambers have general counsel or legal counsel currently? How many don't? you need to find legal counsel. It's very, very important. They pay, uh, play a very key role in getting you to the other side. So I loved everything that Kane talked about, and I've had the pleasure of uh, receiving some training from her partner, David Chavez, but I'm legal. I don't care how you feel. And you need somebody on your team that doesn't care about feelings how you feel. They care about keeping you out of jail and they care about you not being liable and paying a lot of money. And they care about your organization not going down. And so the way I um, work with my chamber is I have the pleasure of working with Andres, who is the chairman of our chamber right now. And Mr. Peter Guzman, who is the president who had to step out for a minute. As a team, we work on dynamics and we talk about how are we going to present things to the board in a way that it will be well received, how will we present things to membership so that it can be well received. But my job as counsel is simply to be worried about the law and making sure everything is followed. So they asked me to speak about bylaws today. Bylaws are what they say. They are the laws of the organization and they should mirror state law and federal law. So if you're in an organization that is changing your bylaws every one to two years, or every time leadership changes, you don't understand what bylaws are. It would be the equivalent of every time there was a new governor in place, every single law changed and you didn't even know how to function, which kind of with COVID, it feels that way. So imagine that feeling all the time. That's what flipping on your bylaws is. So bylaws should be reviewed every three to five years, and they should only be changed if state law or federal law changes. So I'm going to look at the outline, page one. Um, they're going to put it up on the board. The first thing you have to do to determine what your bylaws should say or not say is, what kind of board do you have? Do you have an advisory board? Do you have a fiduciary board? Do you have both? Or do you not even know what that means? And so an advisory board is simply a group of people who are strong leaders in the community. They're not making decisions. They're giving advice based on their expertise and experience. And so you might experience this as a chamber. Everybody wants to be a part of the chamber. Everybody wants to be involved, but maybe they're difficult to work with, or maybe they're not gonna show up at every meeting and it's gonna make all the other board members mad because this one person, because they're so important in the community, doesn't feel like they need to show up. That's a good place, a good fit for an advisory board. You want their involvement, you want their backing, but they're gonna get in the way if they're a part of the decision-making. So if you're finding that this problem is happening over and over, you might want to develop an advisory board. A fiduciary board is a board of directors that has legal authority to take action and make decisions on behalf of the organization and has the responsibility of the well-being of the organization. So a lot of boards get confused. You are not the boots on the ground. It is your job to make sure that the organization stays on mission 
and that it is functioning well and it is not abusing or misusing its resources, be it time, money, or any other resources. And so if you end up with a bunch of people on your board or directors that want to overmanage the staff, you're going to have problems. Who is supposed to be running the day-to-day -day operations of the organization? Anybody? CEO and his or her staff. That is who. So if you have a board of directors that there's email chains going around every day, we have a confused board. Okay. And so we, um, when we're... <laughs> When we're looking at what should be in the bylaws, these are the categories that everybody should hit. Your bylaws might have more categories, but they should at least have these categories. We need to define members. What is a member? What is membership? There's different kinds of membership. Is it a voting membership? In other words, does the entire membership vote for who the directors are every year? Or is it simply membership with benefits? They pay their dues, they're welcome to come to the luncheons, they're welcome to come to the events. What defines membership? Um, and we're not gonna get into detail. So you will see on the next slide, not yet, but there's a huge difference between bylaws and policies and procedures. So when we're discussing members, we're simply defining what is a member and what is the responsibility of a member. Directors who qualifies as a director, and how are directors elected? Officers, who are the officers? Are we going to have officers on the board and officers in staff? Are we only gonna have directors and all of the officers are staff members? These are the types of things that are going to go into the bylaws. Um, are we going to allow committees? I highly recommend committees, but we're not gonna list out every single committee that could exist in your bylaws. That goes in your policies and procedures. Um, liability, are directors gonna be held personally liable for their actions? Hopefully not. And hopefully you have a clause in your bylaws that says that they can be indemnified. Indemnification means if a director is sued, that the organization will cover legal costs and any other costs to defend them as long as they were not negligent and as long as they use reasonableness in making the decisions they made. So if you have a director that goes rogue and signs a million dollar contract and didn't even bring it to the board, they're on their own. They don't get indemnified, but you need to spell out when and how will a director be indemnified in your bylaws. And finally, your financial matters. Who is going to be in charge of finances? Um, are, is the person in charge going to be allowed to invest, make investments? Um, what is the cap on what a CEO can use without getting permission from the board? And when is the fiscal year um, going to begin and going to end? There are not a lot of details. There is a sample bylaw in your notebook that was provided. I have a very generic sample. I did not have enough time to get handouts into the notebook. So I do have business cards. If anybody wants any samples of what I'm talking about, I'm happy to email them to you after the meeting. Bylaws should be short and they should be to the point, like I said, it shouldn't change. What a director is and how they function should not change unless state law or federal law changes. So let's go ahead and move over to screen two. In the policies and procedures, this is where we get into the details. So as I mentioned before, it's your job as the board to keep the organization on mission. Well, how are you going to know what that is if you haven't written it down? You need to identify what your core values are. What is your purpose? Why are you there? Because you like each other and you want to have lunch together. I tease my board, we are not having a party in our abuelita's backyard. This is not a club. We are actually here to accomplish something and we have to remember what our point is. What is our mission? What do we hold ourselves out to the community? What are, what are, what are we doing? And this is not a secret, it's the elephant in the room. As Latino organizations, we are not always regarded as highly as the city chamber of commerce. And so it is very important that you're able to articulate to the community what your purpose is and stay on purpose. Committees, this is where we can write out. We have the gala committee, we have an events committee, we have, uh, you name it, there can be a committee for just about anything, but 
Those may change. You may realize we didn't need this committee. It was useless. Or wait a minute, we need three other committees. That's why it goes in your policies and procedures and not into your bylaws because it's going to be constantly changing. Um, you need to check with your state law to see what's required for committees. In Nevada, at least one board member has to be on a committee and everybody else on the committee can be a non-board member. The great thing about committees is it's a way to vet community members and just members of the organization to see who's willing to put in the work. So you don't want to elect a board of people who think they're special and important. You want to elect a board of people who are going to put on the gloves and do the hard work. And one of the ways to figure that out is by welcoming new people onto committees, getting to know them and how to work with them. Uh, communication. All right. What does that mean? So how are, as a board, how are you going to communicate? Is email appropriate? Does it have to be formal? And uh, do notices have to be sent out by mail? Also communicating to the community. Big news story breaks. What, anybody can just get on channel three, the news, and start speaking on behalf of the chamber. That gets scary. Who is allowed to be a designated spokesperson for the chamber? And you never know when something's going to come up. If a tragedy hits your city or if something hits the Hispanic community in your city and you need to be ready to speak immediately to the media, who's supposed to do that? What are they allowed to say? If your president or one of your board members um, is speaking on behalf of their own company or in some other manner, um, do they need to make it clear that this is not an opinion of the chamber, especially when it comes to politics or other things? This is where you're going to hash this out in your policies and procedures. What is bo board authority and staff authority? What does the board have authority to do? Who's allowed to sign contracts? Who is allowed to um, make decisions? When is it important to bring something in front of the board or when does the CEO have the ability to just make an independent decision? You do not want to handcuff your CEO so that every single time they want to do something, they have to come in front of the board, but you don't want to give them so much liberty that they are out running rogue and the board does not even have a clue what they are doing. So, uh, before I keep talking, does anybody have any questions about bylaws versus policies and procedures? Yes. Here, I'll let you. They can all hear. <laughs> all right. Here's my here's my enchilada question. Uh, when and this is my own personal experience. Uh, when when I started the chamber, um, when you start a chamber. You will, you have two peanuts, a banana, and your and your your computer too. Those are your resources. At least that's what we had. And I, I hope we had, you know, I hope we had like a huge corporate sponsor behind us. We didn't. I mean, we were two bananas and, and, and an old pad. That was it. So we and, and then we had the chance to incorporate, which was because we found an attorney that almost did it pro bono. You know, it was they were super great doing it they helped us so we could incorporate and he they provided us with everything with their papers bylaws he he was a specialized attorney in incorporations okay so the question that i that i would love to have seen that and he helped us a lot and he still does and he's our attorney today the question that would be great for chambers for starting chambers is what can it be your basic minimum things to have in order to comply by law in order to comply with the with the state rules and also to have insurance in case of liability i would love to see like this is a very basic package that everybody should aim to have because the rest committees things you know those those are like already the big leagues and i'm sure that most of the chambers are still in the small league category so, you know, could you, could you like give us a, an example of the very basic package to have so we could be compliant and safe? Sure, that's a great question. So not everybody is at the point that they have a full board, they have staff, they have an attorney. Um, honestly, one great way to start out is as an association. So there's a such thing as a nonprofit association. You do not have to incorporate right away. This will vary by state law in Nevada. 
if two or more people get together for the same purpose, they're automatically considered an association. You can draft articles of association, but you are automatic. Um, several states have adopted this, so you would have to check with your individual state. This is more like at the club level. There's several of us. We wanted to get together. We have a mission and we have a purpose. Um, there are even IRS loopholes for associations that if you uh, raise less than $5,000, uh, you don't have to necessarily apply for tax exempt status. So there's a lot of things. So I would say the worst thing to do is say, okay, we're going to do this and we don't really know what we're doing. So we're going to fill out these secretary of state documents and we're going to incorporate. And then we're going to find all 10 different bylaws offline and we're going to cut and paste. And so I've seen a lot of these cut and paste jobs. And then as the attorney, you go in and read them and you're like, I don't, I don't know what it means because it doesn't mean anything. Because, you know, if you're putting together a bunch of legal terms and you don't know what they mean, you don't even know what you're putting together. And so until you have the resources to incorporate or you have legal counsel that will either do it for you and their, their counsel is out there, you guys just have to get out there and ask for help, then I would not venture um, to do that on your own. But the basic things, once you're ready to incorporate is your articles of incorporation so that you're incorporating with your state and then bylaws. Bylaws, what's the most important about bylaws is also that's how you get your tax exempt status. So when you go to apply for your 501c6, the IRS doesn't like your bylaws, you are not going to get approved. If you don't follow your bylaws and they audit you, you're gonna get your status taken away. And so it's important to have them written well by somebody that understands them. And then it's important for the board to know them and follow them. So um, I'll ask as boards, are you requiring for each director to not only have a copy, but to read your bylaws, or are they just getting handed out and then people put them in the back of their notebook? Everybody should have them at all times and you guys should have them at your meetings. And so, you know, I'll get questions all the time like, Carmen, can we do blah, blah, blah? I don't know, let me open the bylaws. That's the first thing I do as the attorney. And that's the first thing that you guys should do as directors and presidents, check your bylaws. After you check your bylaws, then you check your policies and procedures, and that will tell you um, what you can and can't do. Are there any other questions? Yes. That's a good question. So there's not training for attorneys per se that I'm aware of, but it's important to get an attorney that is familiar with nonprofit law and corporate law because that is what they're doing. So if you get a criminal defense attorney, they may be a fabulous criminal defense attorney. They don't know bylaws any more than you do and they're not helping you. And so just because a friend or somebody who's a member of the chamber but that doesn't understand this area of law, it's important not to use them. To your point that what if the attorney wants to go right and the board wants to go left? That's, that's a good thing. That means <laughs> you're going to have conflict with your attorney. We are there to tell you no, and you're there to say, oh, we're ignoring you this time and we're going in this direction. I am not the client. I have zero rights to make any decisions on behalf of my chamber. I am there to give advice and I am not there to make people happy. I am there to give sound legal advice, whether people want to hear it or not. What they do with it I'm hands off after that. And so you want an attorney that is going to tell you what needs to be heard, not what you want to hear. As the board of directors, you then have to make best practice decisions, right? So if what the attorney tells you to do is gonna end up making you lose a ton of money and shut down, well then what, what good was that? But the attorney can't craft their advice to what is best for the board. The attorney has to give sound legal advice. And so, um, that happens a lot. Attorneys in the board will butt heads a lot. Uh, you said earlier that the bylaws are 
bylaw shouldn't change unless laws change, I think you said? Yes. So our bylaws were written like 20 years ago, and they just didn't really do much with the organization until very recently um, when new leadership took over. So there are like a lot of holes that are missing. I mean, not to say that they weren't sound right. when they started, but so I wanted to check on that because we just voted to add two things last last meeting we had, and going forward, I can see a lot of things that need added. Um, that's a good question. They can get reviewed every three to five years. My point was they shouldn't be changing all the time. And then the way you guys are doing it is dangerous, this piecemeal where we're adding, we're adding, we're adding. What you need to do is do a full review. You need to get a, a committee together. You need to get an attorney and you need to do a full review and just an amended bylaws from scratch. Throw the old one out the window and start over with something solid. Uh -huh. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned if the board of directors makes bad decisions and they're sued or whatever. Um, so how does board of directors meet possible record insurance come into play? Or what does it pay? What does it cover? Good question. So let's go ahead and slide, go to slide three, and we'll start talking about that. So um, as directors, it is your responsibility to um, use care. What does that mean? It's a reasonableness standard. What would a reasonable person in your position decide based on all the advice they're receiving? So are you expected to all of a sudden become an attorney, an accountant, a CPA? No, you're not expected to learn. That's why you hire these people or you have these people volunteering. So if you trust your attorney and you trust your CPA and they tell you to do something and a reasonable person would have used their advice to make a decision, even if it ends up being a bad decision, you are protected. You are protected by law and you should be protected by your bylaws. Um, if you have an attorney that stumbles in drunk every meeting and you guys can smell their breath from a mile away and you're like, but the attorney said, okay, that's not a reasonableness standard. Nobody in their right mind would have listened to that person. Or if the CPA says, you know what, guys, I have this great way to um, hide money and launder it, you know better. Just because the CPA said it doesn't mean you can listen to them. So it's a reasonableness standard. And that's what should be written into your bylaws with regard to indemnification. If a director uses reasonableness to make a decision and depends on the professionals that they've hired, then they should not be held liable. Um, so yeah, I have DNO insurance at the end. I don't have too many answers about that because I'm not an insurance person. If you don't already have its director and officer liability insurance, you need it ASAP. You need to put it in the budget or pay for it out of your own pocket. I myself had the misfortune of last year um, being sued by an angry opposing party um, luckily, I had my professional liability insurance in place, and it did not bankrupt me because it would have. And so as directors, it seems like, well, we just get together and we have lunches and we do events and it's not a big, it is a big deal. If the wrong thing has, somebody gets hurt at one of your events, if you sign a contract with somebody and something goes wrong, what I tell people is nothing is going to stop anyone from putting your name on the pleading. You very well may get sued as a director. Absolutely nothing stops them from putting your name on the pleading. Where the bylaws and everything comes into play, that's your defense. Once you've gotten sued, how do you get out of it unscathed is with your director's and officer's liability insurance because the insurance company is covering all the costs. And if you have your bylaws in place and your policies and procedures and you have been following them and you can show record of following them, that's what the attorneys use to get you out of the case. Um, that's the only one I'm aware of. An insurance carrier would know more, but it, directors and officers, errors and omissions is what you need. Yes, that, that, that should cover it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is a good question. I have one over here. And I have a sample of a confidentiality agreement. So again, if you guys want it, I can email it to you. Basically, let me pull it up. Number one, anything to do with your finances. 
Just like you don't run around talking about what's in your own bank account, don't run around talking about what's in the chamber's bank account. Um, of what? I do, I have it right here. And like I said, I can email it to you guys. So I, you know, grab a, one of my cards and then I can email it to you guys. So this one basically says um, obligation not to disclose and to maintain the confidentiality of the confidential information shared by the organization with board members. Um, so anything that you guys are discussing as a board, how are we going to make this decision? The, the general public, unless it's an open meeting, you shouldn't go home and tell your spouse. You shouldn't go tell your best friend. You, When you are sitting on the board, you are sitting in a fiduciary capacity and you have an obligation of confidentiality. Um, something else that anybody that emails me that I will email to you is Nevada's put out a great manual for directors. Obviously, Nevada law is going to be a little bit different, but a lot of the concepts are going to be the same about what does it mean to be a director and what is your responsibility. And so people forget, oh, it was my best friend. They would never tell anybody. And they're blabbing out in the restaurant and they don't know who's sitting in the booth behind them. And so um, anything that's public knowledge, you know, for example, it became public knowledge that this conference was coming here. It was out in the media. And so if a director from the Latin Chamber of Commerce wanted to discuss with their friends how excited they were the conference was coming, then that would be appropriate. However, when it was in the works in the making and we were in the running and the discussions were happening about how will this, that is not appropriate information to share with your friends, family, media, or the public. So it, it sounds silly, but it's kind of common sense, but it's not common sense that a lot of people exercise. And I think it's because they you as a person decide who is your safety net? Who do you trust? Who would you run and tell you were having a problem with your spouse? Who would you run and tell your dirty laundry? But this is not about you. This is about the organization. And the only people that the organization have decided to trust are the people sitting at the table. So I can send a sample. This sample came from, I think, the Plastic Surgeon Society. It's a good sample. So, you know, when you get it, it's not going to say a chamber on it, but it's still a good sample. The other one that I've been asked to discuss and I have up here is conflict of interest. What is a conflict of interest? And does everybody have a conflict of interest policy? And are you making your director sign it? So I know that here in Vegas, we have established the habit of every January, everybody gets the conflict of interest policy, the confidentiality agreement and the bylaws all over again, even if it's the same one you had last year, if we've had to tweak it a bit, you get the new one and everybody's asked to read it and sign off that they have it and they understand it. Because if you let it go three, four years, people forget that it exists. So you might wanna do something like that every year in January or whenever your fiscal year starts or whenever you have your board retreat, everybody's gonna get them again, we're gonna review them and we're gonna make sure we understand them. So conflict of interest, there's a difference between a potential conflict of interest and an actual conflict of interest. So what is a potential conflict of interest? Any time that you in your individual capacity or a business or a family member that you're affiliated with is going to conduct business with the chamber, there's a potential conflict of interest that has to come in front of the board. If you own 20% of a linens company and it's not really public knowledge and the board is planning an event and they talk about, oh, we're gonna use ABC linens um, and we're gonna contract with them. And you are sitting there knowing you own 20% of that company, you don't disclose it, that's a problem. You cannot vote to do business with yourself. And so when the conflict of, potential conflict of interest comes before the board, whoever is involved in the potential conflict of interest has to excuse themselves, cannot be a part of the discussion and cannot be a part of the vote. Once the vote happens, how does a board decide if it in fact is a conflict of interest or it is not? And so you can use several standards. If there's 20 linen companies and their prices are all about the same, don't use the one where a board member owns a part of that company. That's a conflict of interest. If um, 
let's say you want to have a, a golf event and one of your directors or even one of your members owns a golf club and a reasonable price to have charged for the day for everybody to be there was 50,000, but they, you know, we want Pedro to make some money. He's always been good to us. We're going to pay him 500,000. That's called money laundering. That's a conflict of interest. That is, you're not paying him a fair rate and there was no competition. You didn't get bids from anywhere else. That is a conflict of interest. Uh, it also makes a difference. Is it a one-time thing? We had this one golf event. We're doing business with the director, a member one time, and then it's over. Or is it ongoing? We are constantly renting this building from one of our directors. We are consistently doing business with one of our directors. That is a huge problem. And let me tell you where the problem comes in with the IRS. Because remember, you're a public, you're not a charity, but you're a public organization. You don't belong to anyone. You don't belong to the directors. You belong to the community. And so as directors and even as members, you cannot derive a direct benefit. Otherwise, that's like having ownership. And so can a director or member do business with the chamber? Yeah. But you have, there's a lot of, and I don't have a checklist. You might want to Google it. I'll see if I can find something and, and send that out as well. What defines a conflict? Because it's not black and white. Just because it's a director and the chamber does not make it an audit. It's a potential conflict, but then you have to use that reasonableness standard. If it's the only golf club in town, just because the director is an owner, are you going to say, okay, now we can never have a golf event? <laughs> <laughs> For more reasons than the hair color. Uh, so, yes. Maybe next time when you see me, I'll have the hair back blonde or something. Anyway, so um, we've been here for a few hours at this point. So I know that the energy and the antsiness is getting to you. So hopefully what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna talk a little bit about chamber strategy. I know that I just was having a really great conversation with Veronica um, about some strategy issues that she's having in Georgia. So perhaps, you know, any, you know, this, uh, bring some things to thought that may or may not be included in the presentation. Um, but one of the things I want you to do is to go through an exercise of a brief strategic planning process. Um, so think about a challenge that you're facing right now at your chamber, and let's see if we can apply this process in some way to help you think through it, and hopefully at least you will be bringing back home um, some ideas of how to think about the issue and solutions for it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through an exercise that our chamber in, in Philadelphia went, went through last year when we were confronted with COVID-19 and the challenge of event-based organizations that relied so much on in-person, you know, being in person, uh, doing programs and networking sessions to being at home and not being able to do any of it, right? So uh, the, problem, the problem at the time, and you can use this with any problem or any challenge that you're facing today. Um, is that COVID-19 has uh, impact on workers, customers, commercial activity threatens not only the viability of our members, but really the viability of the chamber. So how can we support our members and generate revenue within the constraints that existed at the time? And really we're seeing that right now. We are seeing how many economies, many cities, many states are sort of contracting opening and contracting. And it is expected that the situation will be going on for the next year, year and a half, and God knows uh, you know, for how long. So this exercise hopefully will help us go through that. So the case study is really a recalibrate, retool, restart campaign. Um, and that's sort of what we came up with as a result of this exercise that I'm talking about. Um, so what we used with, uh, was a, a business canvas model approach. Uh, those of you that have technical assistance programs or work closely with small business development centers might be familiar with this tool. It's a planning tool. tool. It's not, you know, it's, it's good for, for quick, easy, sort of um, at a glance kind of strategic planning. It's not your super in-depth, uh, you know, very calculated, but I think it really gets the job done, particularly if you're a small chamber that doesn't have a lot of um, assets or a lot of capacity. Um, so, you know, it helps in laying out the crucial activities, the challenges involved, 
with your chamber. Um, you know, you look at existing programs, develop new initiatives, and really think about everything about your chamber. How does it meet that proposition or what you're trying to achieve? So if you take a piece of paper, you have a lot of it, and in the back of one of them, you replicate this. And I'll give you two or three minutes to do that. And I would have given you a handout, but since we need some exercise here, right? So what we're gonna be looking at is what is it that you do, right? As a chamber, what is really that you do? And most importantly, what do you do for Latino businesses? Who do you specifically help? How do you interact with them? How do you reach them? How do you do it? What do you need in order to be able to do all of that? How much does it cost you? And how much will you make? Because ultimately, if you have no dollars, you have no mission and you certainly have no chamber. So we're gonna go through this and hopefully there's a challenge that you have in mind and we can, we can help you solve it. So this is the challenge that, I, that we had at the time. What does the Hispanic Chamber do? You can find it here. We promote Latino-owned businesses, provide access to the tools, networks, resources that they need in order to scale, right? And who specifically do we do that for? We do that for scaled Latino businesses. We do that for unscaled Latino businesses. We do it for Latino professionals, okay? So when people ask you at the Hispanic, at your Hispanic chamber, what do you do? Monica, M Melanie, sorry. Melanie, what do you do at the Hispanic chamber in Pittsburgh? Okay. And so, and who are your customers? Okay, not too many. That's good. I have a really good strategic planning coach and he says, no more than two audiences, please. Nobody can do more than two things at a time. No organization can. So then he's like, but I know you're gonna give me two more. So really not more than four, right? So at the Hispanic Chamber, we have decided that our primary customers are gonna be scale Latino owned businesses. We define those about those that have $1 million or more, more in sales, right? Um, unscaled Latino businesses with fewer than, uh, with less than a million dollars in sales, which happens to be 96% of Latino owned businesses in Philadelphia, right? So only 4% have employees. So really that's why what we do is really promote and provide resources to scale Latino owned businesses. Our secondary audience are Latino professionals because it's a niche market, because we, we believe that if we support uh, the ascension of Latino professionals in corporate ladder, we will have a much better time getting resources for Latino owned businesses. So it's really a 360 proposition. At the time, what did you, what do we do? What did the Hispanic Chamber do before COVID-19? Well, we promoted Latino owned businesses. Um, you go, how did you do it? Uh, we, do the, we did that through in-person meetings, mixers, conferences, and classes, right? In order to do that work, we needed speakers, venues, curriculum, communications, experts, and partners, right? Um, and how did we reach them before COVID-19? Any number of ways, but social media, we, we build audiences through events, um, we have a newsletter, right? And we derived our, our sales or our money from sponsorships, membership fees, ticket sales grants, and fee for, fee for service um, contracts. And the expenses that we had related to space rental, catering, travel expenses, advertising, and such, right? But what happens with COVID? With COVID, we were doing in-person meetings, mixers, meetings, conferences. All of that went away. We couldn't be in person anymore. So that becomes a red flag for us. So you see the red flag up there. 
So what couldn't we do? The in-person became an issue. The mixers became an issue. Meetings, classes, we figured virtual became something that we could potentially do, right? How did we interact? So much of what we did was in person, right? So that became, again, a red flag. And how much money will you make? If we cannot have events, we cannot sell tickets. If we cannot have events, we don't have sponsorships. If we have sponsorships, we cannot, we cannot do anything. So that became another red flag, right? Um, and then, you know, who helps you accomplish all of this key partners. So if you think about your chamber and you work with um, Latino businesses, you support students, whatever, during COVID, did you experience the same? Yeah, right. And so does anybody right now have any challenges that they're facing? Every day is a challenge, right? I mean, so so right, so to let you to tell you, we have a conference that we do every year in August. We had to reschedule it for October. Um, we thought that we were going to be in person in August. That didn't happen because the Delta variant and nightmare. No, nobody was registering. We used to have like 150 people in this conference. So we have decided to move it to October. Yes. It is a challenge, right? So let's see what we can do about it. Does anybody have another challenge that perhaps is not related to COVID? <laughs> all, the, all the challenges are COVID challenges, right? Uh, you do? You had a hurricane. <laughs> so what, what is a hurricane doing? Okay, so, so what is a hurricane preventing you from doing? What are you not doing anymore? So the question of what do you need, how do you do it in person meetings, mixers, conference and classes is somewhat impacted, right? Because if you were planning to go back in person and now you don't have electricity or water, it makes it harder. And in terms of what will it cost and how much will you make, all those sponsorships are and, and ticket sales are probably at risk, right? Okay. So what we figured out is, Okay, given the challenge, what is it that we can do with what we have, right? So we decided, okay, we're gonna help scaled and unscaled businesses. We have our tertiary and secondary audiences, but now we can help, let's think about COVID impacted Latino owned businesses. They're severely impacted. That's really, really not, not every industry is equally impacted. So, what can we do specifically for impacted Latino-owned businesses in Philadelphia that really particularly meant retail, you know, business to consumer, um, you know, barbershops, beauty salons, uh, you know, event spaces, restaurants, right? Um, and then we will continue to support them. How are we going to support them? We cannot do it in person. Mixers were out of the question. So of course we went to video, uh, virtual, but one thing we thought about was a marketing campaign. We're like, 
if we market and help Latino owned restaurants, right? The thing that they needed the most at the time was money. The thing that we knew about Latino owned restaurants in Philadelphia is that the majority of them were really small mom and, mom, mom and pop shops that didn't really have social media presence, didn't really have um, DoorDash. They did everything. They had a small hole in the wall restaurant that was very loved by the community and they served in person. And now they didn't have a way of really selling because nobody knew they did takeout. Nobody knew they did delivery and nobody knew they existed because they're not in social media, right? So, and exactly, right? So we decided city of Philadelphia closed down March 16th. By April 4th, our team had decided we're gonna create a marketing and social media campaign called Dine Latino, uh, Dine Latino or Latino Takeout. And so we got together, issued a press release, went out to the press and we said, this is what we're gonna do, right? All the media picked it up because people were looking at the time for good news. So it was all over the place. We had 70 restaurants signed up for this social media campaign. And we said, huh, maybe we can make money with that, right? So how do you reach them? We were doing social media, but now we were really doing social media. We created an Instagram account called Dine Latino PHL. We put a landing page on our website. We had a form people would register. We just decided that we we're gonna do a process. And then we started saying people going out and enrolling partners and, and doing things like that. How much will it cost? I don't have to pay space rental. $2,000, I don't need space rental. I don't need catering. I don't need travel expenses. Advertising in social media is pretty darn cheap if you do it right. All we need is a beefed up communications consultant and we just went out for it, right? And so what do we do? Now we do content, very strong communications. We then also look for business experts and capital for micro business grants and a virtual platform. So what we ended up doing was packaging this idea of Dine Latino Takeout and putting it in a, with a nice logo, with a problem statement, with some benefits, and we just started selling it, right? That, um, that actually gave us the idea of what else can we do and how can we put a lot of the work that we already currently do at the Hispanic Chamber and repackage it and sell it for COVID-19, right? Don't have to do. So what does it take? Hmm, what do we call it? We like the R, we got retool, R plus. We just had, uh, we had a strategy session and we said, what do you like it? We listed all the R's, you know, recalibrate, retool, rethink, reimagine. How do you say it in Spanish? Do they, you know, do they work in Spanish and English? And then we had a graphic designer that created that because we had four partners in the campaign. Each partner had a color, each color got in a logo and that was created. So why recalibrate, retool, restart? Because re, another R, opening in the new normal requires more than turning on the lights. So we went to our banks that would have sponsored our Alegria Ball um, that we didn't do because there was no mixing. Um, we went to other, to people that would fund us for, for events and we said, um, your money is still needed. We want you to put it instead of in our event in this recalibrate, retool, restart campaign. Because all these businesses need us today and will need us when this is over because things are never going to be the same. And the only people that can help them do and navigate this are us, right? So about the campaign, we just got some really nice language with a lot of R's in the middle and then we highlight them red. And basically, again, the idea is that without the chamber's help, these businesses would not be able to reintegrate into the economy. And we wanted them to do that successfully in order to operate 
in the new normal. So this is what you do already. I mean, we just repackaged it and put a logo on it, right? And so we did do some language tweaking around really being statistic, legal, very specific around COVID-19, right? And we're just what are the campaign elements? We sort of thinking about, you know, what is the language of communications campaigns? You know, what are people thinking when you're saying you're launching a campaign? And we just took a lot of the work that we already did and we repackaged it and here it is, right? Um, a lot of the things that we did got new logos because the whole campaign needs to all be coordinated. So when we used to do technical assistance, we call it, we solve it in 30. We cannot do it in person. Now we do it online and we say, you give us 30 seconds, you give us 30 minutes and we give you all the answers, right? So here, and all those, res all those 30 minute segments, you compile them and now you have a library. So now you market the library, right? Um, then we used to do an annual, um, our annual conference. We used to call it Closing the Gap. Wes, we did Closing the Gap, R Plus edition. And here it is, and we did it online. And so Dying Latino turned out to be extended because it went so well, but we know that the media has only so much um, bandwidth and how long are you going to really promote a hashtag? We decided, well, it's the same thing. Let's just do a restaurant week. So now we do Dying Latino restaurant week in the fall and in the spring. And the media ate it up, like, right? And we were able to fundraise for it. So we also received funding from the USHCC um, through some grant for micro grants and from other organizations for micro grants. And we called that the R plus small business grant fund, right? So all those money that came in so that we would redistribute ended up going and we just labeled them under this micro grant campaign. And then we asked people, how can we, so how can you support the campaign? You can enroll volunteer, contribute and sponsor. We ended up raising, without asking for dollars, phone calls coming in and saying, we want to fund that, we want to fund that, I really like what you're doing. We received a $30,000 check from, from a corporate sponsor that the year before had only given us $5,000, right? So that is, so, so this exercise of really thinking about your problem or challenge, thinking about the resources that you have, thinking really about what your customer needs. In this case, where customers, our customers were small businesses highly impacted by COVID-19, what do they need? And if you think a little bit outside the box and really let your staff lead it, in many ways, this was just a brainstorming session. And somebody said something and said, you know what? We can do that because if we are going to wait for the government to come up with a relief program, it's gonna take months. So the thing that we could do that was the most impactful was send traffic, send customers to, to Latino-owned businesses in the neighborhood, knowing that they didn't have the capacity to promote themselves. If we had not done that, we would, Dine Latino Restaurant Week would not have happened. The R Plus campaign wouldn't have happened. A lot of it was really being sort of thinking outside the box and repackaging what we already did and it has worked. Um, so, you know, so I'm wondering, does, does anybody have a story or a challenge and they need help? Because we can might as well, how much do I have? A few minutes. We might as well use this as a lab, right? No idea, yes. We had the same challenge, essentially. Mm -hmm. The first thing was, how do you turn out to your corporate sponsors and tell them that you're not going to have any in-person events? Mm -hmm. okay? Because that's the first thing we asked. What happened? So in, my, in our experience, what, when we turned out and we explained that because of state ordinances, the in-person meetings were first shut down completely, and then now it's not a thing that you can do looking forward to. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Gracias. And then, uh, so yes, the first thing is we explained to the our corporate sponsors the, the incapacity that we had to make in-person events. And this is the, 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 the reasoning that we used was to, gracias, and protect them. Okay. You can be tight to Never. me for oh, 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 come on. Are you going to be like that? No, no. <laughs> and, then, and then the second thing that we did is that we came a resource for information. So we posted on the first on our webpage, on our central landing page, we posted COVID resources. So that had to do first, on the very first beginning, all we, had a, we have a partnership with SBA. So a lot of our, our, our members were going bankrupt. And a lot of them, the latest statistic from the census is that around 56% of all Latino businesses in the United States have less than three employees. Mm -hmm. So that means that a lot of them hadn't any employees and they didn't know they could apply to the PPP program. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we sort of got them close through the US bank, which is a, a corporate platform, and we were able to save some of their businesses. I hope we could have the one. So my question to you, so you took these businesses and you referred them to US bank. Did they give you a fee for that? Did they give you, did they pay you for that? You need to go back to them and say, we provide, okay, so here, if you refer any applicants or PPP, there is a process for you to get a commission and a referral fee out of every single loan that you gave that bank, right? So what is it that we can do? We can help businesses apply. You don't even need to help them apply. All you need to do is give a warm referral. And if they apply and get funding, you get paid, right? And so that's approved by the SBA, right? So a lot of it, so, so you're telling me, and this is a challenge that all of us have right now, so the first year, you know, in 2020, you had your galas and your mixers and your events and the funders said, okay, I'll give you the money. I know you need it. I understand that you're not gonna be able to do it. We'll, we'll let you use the dollars for operations. That works that year one in an emergency. That's not gonna work in 2022. So what are we going to do in 2022, right? So, so, Right, so that's where this idea of a communication campaign with some special something or other attached to it that has perhaps a micro grant attached to it, you package it all and you there's something for everybody to, as I would say, chew on, right? Yes. I, I, I didn't know what you were gonna say and you didn't know what I'm gonna say. But what I'd like to do, I think you can all hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what, what we're doing in, in just a quick minute ago, I have these, I'll hand these all out, something you may have seen. In Kansas City, I found out something a long time ago in my business that uh, a, great Nicole, uh, a great French general, Napoleon Bonaparte said that men will die for ribbons. And, Men will die for ribbons. In other words, recognition. And an unfortunate thing is most Hispanics companies do not receive the recognition they deserve. They are not, the public is not aware of how much they do contribute to the and how much they do give back. And during COVID, there's been so much closing down and, and shutting down. So we're, we're doing a thing called the Festival of Treats. I'll hand this out. I brought some for all of us. And what I'd like to do is ask you to take it if I can help you, my number's on me, you call me, I'll help you organize it, I'll help you put it together, I'll help you to go, and it'll be the greatest group you ever did. And, and, the and of, what is the Festival the of Treats? Is, is that we've gotten several companies to come over, and they're going to take the Christmas tree, and put it back. Kansas City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, we have a collaborative. We have the Young Latino Professionals, and we have lots of Young Latinos for tomorrow. 
those are the high school and the college are your professors. We've incorporated those two groups along with the Hispanics. We have three organizations which have over 600 members. And we reached out with them and now those companies are coming and donating a tree, a Christmas tree. And they're gonna decorate that Christmas tree. And they're gonna bring that Christmas tree to our Christmas party, the Kansas City Club. And we're gonna auction the tree off. And the companies typically will buy their own tree. Now think about that. Not only will they give us the money, they're gonna pay for it. So, so they will donate the tree. Then what we're gonna do, what I mean by die for riches, we will have a select 30% of the trees we contribute that we collect. Let's say we get 30. 10 of them we will recognize. Most are rich, most sports, most uh, team oriented. We will give them a big ribbon and a walk to the tree. And then we have another member of our chamber that will auction off the money. And then those monies we were going to go ahead and working in collaboration with the school district are giving the trees to children's needing families that probably wouldn't have it. And in addition to the sponsorship, and I'm going to sponsor just many of your famous and there's way too much money, give me a call, okay? You know? It's all right, you don't ask, you don't get, you know, uh, we'll take a sponsorship and then not only that, but we're going to be here. Christmas. So when you talk about something that does the full circle, and we're, we're getting a lot of traction, we're getting a lot of the companies that's coming in, we're getting a lot of them that's interested to want to do something. Mm -hmm. And most people will do something if you ask. The reason they don't is because they don't ask. So I don't have so there's 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 an idea there and so the idea is again you're giving somebody for different audiences to to really support right uh, but i really one thing that i i would say that i've noticed in the last year is that moving away from in in my region at least moving away from events and more into programs that really do have outcomes and support the development and growth of Latino businesses in ways that you can count. So we have been very successful in, in doing that this year. And we decided that events are gonna be a challenge for us moving forward and that more programmatic work is looked upon more favorably and we have had great support. So we, um, some of you are doing Avanzar so I don't know if you are able to leverage Avanzar beyond what the USHC Hispanic Chamber does, but I'm thinking that there are foundations in your communities um, because there's so much talk about black, brown, and other um, ethnic businesses being impacted. You might be able to leverage that program and raise additional dollars for it, right? Um, think about other groups you can partner with and perhaps do some fundraising for programmatic work. We are right now partnering with a surety bond organization that does capacity building in English for construction companies. We said, let's partner and let's do it in Spanish for the Latino community. And we've raised in a matter of four months, close to $100,000 for that program, right? And so there is, I am concerned that chambers of commerce that tend to be event-driven organizations are going to continue having challenges with sponsorships because it is so uncertain. And we let's not depend on our events for the viability and sustainability of the organization. Let's think about the assets that we have, how we can redeploy them in different ways, get creative, um, think about the you know, think about the industries in your uh, community that are heavily clustered around Latinos. Conversely, think about industry sectors where there's so few Latinos, people would pay you to bring Latino businesses to them. And think about how you can really use your power and your might. And if a bank and if, if have conversations with financial institutions that you're doing work with, because there, if they do SBA lending and you refer a client that gets a loan, you should be getting a referral fee for that. So do not let, don't leave dollars on the ground. Do not sign MOUs with other organizations 
that are going to use your name as an organization could go and get $300,000 in grants and you're not going to see a penny of that. Negotiate your participation, negotiate your relationships. I find that we are leaving money in the table for no good reason. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Jennifer, Hi. Jennifer. Hi, my name is Olivia Rios. I am with the LA Latino Chamber. One of the things that we're doing is leveraging all our financial institutions. We recently, yeah, it's public. So. so we recently created a business loan program where one of our cabs is our financial chair. And so he is taking the lead on collaborating with other financial institutions to bring a loan, a business loan program. The chamber is not loaning money. We simply have an application process he will lead it and he would feed it to other financial institutions to see who is willing to talk to the business owner and uh, possibly get a loan. And so we're only making the connection and the introduction. We're not managing anything. We're not. So what we're doing that we're only doing it for our members. So you're welcome to view it at lalcc.org business loans. And are you getting a, an organization fee from it? Uh, that's in discussions, but what, what we are trying to do is speed up the money to go out to the community. You need to get paid for that. Okay. I okay. Anybody else? My name is Karina Garcia. I'm the program coordinator in the Nashville Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And I'm going to mention a challenge that I'm sure you might all um, have dealt with. So it's the challenge of liability. We're talking liability. liability, yeah. We're talking about a change of orientation. So the chambers before were oriented more in event planner, and now it's more program or technical assistance. And I personally assisted people to do the PPP application, but there's the liability part of that, that um, as a person who assisted them directly, they trust me, but then the, what is the, the role of the chamber in case something goes bad? Like I, I know they appreciate our work, but at the same time, there's some there's the, that part of the liability that we need to be aware. And when we talk about loans and programs, so I'm wondering how do you deal with these challenges and also about the legal capacity of a chamber to lend money like you said you not, don't directly lend that money but then that conflict of interest of like suggesting and then getting the fees is something that's a bit confusing for me i'm new here so. okay so on the ppp side it's a government program right we do not do any underwriting we do not complete the application necessarily we refer the client to the business to the to the lender we refer them perhaps to an accountant or a bookkeeper that it people that if something goes wrong they're the ones that get sued because they are the experts we are not accounting experts we are not attorneys but the referral warrants a fee otherwise that but for your referral that loan would not have been made because that client would not have gone to that bank right so there is a fee Right. In terms of capacity building and education programs, we work with provide curriculum providers. We don't create the curriculum. We work with an organization that certifies somebody to train in the curriculum, and we bring experts to do the work. So in that, we and we raise dollars in order to be able to license the curriculum, train the trainer that gets certified and does all of that and then gives the class. So we work through evidence-based, approved, certified, trained. We don't make it up as we go along. <laughs> that just not recommended. Basically, what do you get? Basically, what do you get back? That fee. Um, so I think it's about, do we have an SBA lender here? three percent depending we actually um we worked with one of the i think it was like the sixth largest bank and okay. we did um 
where they created a whole online platform. We had it in English and Spanish. You could also call and get one-on-one -on -one help. We didn't do anything but refer them and it checked everything. Um, but the numbers were between one and 3% with everyone that we wanted to work with. And we actually didn't go with the highest because they were the only one that would have it in Spanish as well. But I wanna add what you were to what you were saying about um, not reinventing the wheel. You know, we don't know all these trainings and things, but when we're getting the grants and funding for that, I know a lot of people forget like their overhead or they forget their percentage for staff. Like that's something I just wanted to add, like always include that. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, yes. Hi, how are you? I represent the West Michigan Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, first of all, you know, this is a, a great opportunity to share, you know, what others are doing. And I completely agree with you about refocusing as uh, Hispanic Chambers, you know, and moving, you know, from events, you know, networking, you know, after hours to more programming. Um, four years ago, I presented my board of directors, um, a couple of uh, initiatives, long-term vision, 25, 30 year term. Um, with a goal to really, you know, make an impact in, in, in the Latino community in West Michigan. You know, we are um, in the next 25 years, the Latino community in the area where I, that I represent, you know, is going to grow 130%, you know, and the Anglo community is going to grow 4% and the African-American community just 45%. So we are the group that is leading the, the, uh, the uh, change in demographics. So finding your value proposition. What I presented were two initiatives. One is called Transformando West Michigan with a goal to revitalize the entire Latino business community in the greater Grand Rapids area where, where, where we are in the next 25 to 30 years. You know, so uh, the first uh, uh, cohort that we put together was for 11 restaurants and we brought partners you know, to the table. We brought uh, uh, financial education, principal financial, was flying an executive from Phoenix, Latino, to Grand Rapids, Michigan, to be able to provide, uh, 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 you know, uh, the financial piece, you know, in, in Spanish. We brought the food safety certification um, organization firm, you know, local, to help these 11 restaurants, you know, get certified, you know, to handle the food. We brought Gordon Food Service, which is, you know, a large uh, corporation that handles, you know, uh, uh, food processing, uh, to bring inventory management you know, knowledge to these 11 restaurants. We brought uh, Grand Valley State University to help these restaurants to write uh, executive summary for business plans. And one of our attorneys, you know, firms donated $35,000 in free legal advice to these 11 restaurant business owners. So bringing partners to the table has been amazing. Uh, foundations are behind this work. We just received another uh, $400,000 to continue our work for the next three years. So that's, thank you. So that's one piece that uh, the mission of our chamber is increase economic advancement of Latino owned businesses and support the professional growth of Latinos. So it's economic development for businesses, but also professionals. The other initiative that I presented, it's called Building Bridges Through Education with a goal to create a pipeline that connects Latinx college students with area employers. So we have uh, in 2018, over 6,000 Latino college students within the six local universities. And uh, they weren't getting, you know, opportunities, you know, for internships, you know, within our corporations that we have in Michigan. So the goal is to bring partners, you know, to offer, you know, those Latino students, you know, opportunities, develop them. And this is another uh, uh, program that we just uh, were recognized. You know, if you wanna see this, we were just recognized by excellence in education as one of the 21 finalists in the, in the entire nation. You know, uh, this program that if you wanna see, I can share with you. And we had another half a million dollars for this program. So anyway, we are moving from events, from an annual awards gala or goal founding or Latino 5K to really make programs, you know, that make an impact in the community. So I just wanted to share that with you. That is fantastic. And if you notice, what he did was package resources that were already existing into, so he took the safe serve, the university, the, 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 the uh, institution that, um, the business that could do the packaging. So he just took all of those things and he packaged it into a program and he went out there and sold it. 
right? So who do you have in your ecosystem that can help you in a key industry in your community? Construction is the highest growing industry in the Latino community, food, hospitality, food entrepreneurs. You know, there's a need for Latinos in technology. Are there any programs in your community that are very high valued, very well regarded, that are done in English and not in Spanish, that are done in neighborhoods outside of your community and that geographic language and cultural access have been denied? And you can go and you can advocate for that. And you can say, we can do it. We'll bring the partners. We'll translate the documents. Everybody's afraid of translation. We're not, right? Package that, sell it, raise the dollars you can. Just to share um, one project that we are um, and has been successful, this is our second round. We partner with an organization, Israeli organization in Rhode Island called Rhode Island Israel Collaborative. And through the consulate, we receive from Wix, which is a, a giant uh, website platform developers. And they donate us 50, initially 50 premium license to give it to the business owner, Latino business owner. But instead to just give it the, the license, we start a contest between college students to hire, to bring those students to develop the website. So we are connecting the Latino, the student community with the business community. And it was so successful that the first round was with one college. Now we have two college and two universities sending a student to be part of the project. And um, in the, our first round, five out of 20 students keep working with the organization and the business that they created previously the, the, the website. So in the second round that is a, just started last week, we have 25 business owners, 25 students, but the listing of people who is waiting for that is growing. Uh, there are two universities who send e emails, hey, you, did, you never did tell me nothing about that. So there are growing interest. And in other side, uh, Wix, the company, is looking how to grow that even nationally. So if there is any, any chamber here that could be interested, I could put in contact with the managers. And I think that is a very good thing because the business owners have presence. We are trying to, to drive customers to them. The students are learning about the business community and they are doing matching and the university are working in that. Mm -hmm. And my question to you, are you getting paid? Are you, the chamber, getting paid? Or are you just bringing people together and running the program? No, what we are learning is that uh, we have some financial institutions that want to be the face, and they are supporting the chamber, giving us sponsorship. So he's going to get paid. Okay, because that's what, that's what happens, right? You do the work. You do the match. Wix gets great press. The university gets their students to do volunteer work that is really meaningful, that they're, it's so good they're getting engaged. The question is, are you getting paid, right? So if you're not, if they, if they were not getting paid, I would package that, put a nice logo, call it something that is not called the Institute of Blood, give it a good name and go and say, I need $100,000. I mean, do the math, but, but do not sell yourself short. I do not do, and I'll leave with this, but this idea of banks give you $2,000 and you're supposed to have a picture and be glad that they gave you $2,000? No, no, I'll send a secretary for that, right? So do not, do like, who, who's that? Noemi Campbell would not get off bed for less than $10,000, right? Don't get out of bed for less than $10,000. Do not applaud anybody that gives you $5,000. It's great and you have some, and it's good, but really the work that we are doing is so important. It is so labor intensive. It should be valued as such. Another part of the strategy is to create a need between the participants. Now Wix is interested. The university that wants to continue. Now is the moment to Oscar, I will do it free the first time just to show it works. If anybody wants you to do it a second time, they need to pay you. It takes a lot of effort. And oftentimes, 
we just do it because it's the right thing to do, because our businesses need it. But ultimately, it's not really long-term sustainability of the chambers is, is really not going to work out. No, no, that's fine. Um, quick, I had a quick question. So this is the, going to the 501c3 or to the 501c6 chamber side of these different programs that are being discussed today? 501c3 or the 501c6? C3. C, and that's what I was alluding to. So from the C6 side, I just have a question out there. How for some best practices on how membership design has changed in COVID? Just an open question for everybody. That's a very good question. Does anybody have any changes to their membership structure during COVID? Um, I can actually speak on it in a few minutes. Oh, well then don't answer. Oh, no, but it, it's, uh, it's, it, you know, my first question is going to be who in here has increased their fees. So that's a, that's one thing not to be afraid to ask for money. And it was tough. Oh, I mean, I can get more into it. We actually dropped down our small business uh, membership fee from what used to range from two hundred fifty to seven hundred fifty thousand uh, seven hundred fifty dollars. It is now a blanket sixty nine dollars a year, less than twenty five cent cents a day. Uh, because going after membership costs too much. I might as well just say sixty nine dollars. You're a member and focus on raising money. This thing about chasing. Latino owned businesses that are so challenged for dollars. When we did the analysis, it just cost too much for the renewal and for the effort that we decided if we just bring it down to a really, really minimal flat fee that the people don't think about it when you send the renewal and they just pay it, that's like out of the way. Uh, that's the way that now Philadelphia, unlike many of the cities represented here, has in the Latino community a 40 poverty, a 40% poverty rate in the Latino community. So the Latino owned businesses that we work with are really low and moderate income community businesses. So we really couldn't charge them $500 like we were in the past, particularly during the pandemic. Um, and so we just made a blank blanket decision to test the market and it's working fairly well for us right now. I you know, each of you would need to do your own analysis, but. for $69 a year for small businesses. Corporate is everything, you know, only small businesses get that flat fee. Everybody else pays, you know, probably closer to your ranges. Nope, nope, nope. Yeah, I'm like, I'm not even, <laughs> I'm telling you, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not sweating any of that anymore. <laughs> And that's, yeah, but I guess each market is definitely unique. Yes, yes. And people engaged. Yeah, we have. Yeah. in Utah, we're a 501c3. We're not a chamber. We haven't, there is no active Hispanic. There are Hispanic chambers in Utah that exist, but they don't do a whole lot. The Utah Hispanic Chamber actually shut down about two years ago and is just now kind of reactivating. But they keep working under these that older model of reliant upon small businesses to fund the chamber's activities. And we do small business development for minorities, primarily Hispanic <coughs> populations. And we... <laughs> The Utah Hispanic Chamber came to us about a year and a half ago and said, we want you to take us over. And we said, we won't, not based on the way the chamber has worked in the past. Because of that, as a C3, we do fundraising. That's how we get our money. We don't rely on our clients to, I mean, it's our client earn revenues like 8% of what we make. So to rely on these small businesses who are already struggling and say, we want you to give us $1,000 a year or $700 a year or whatever it is, 
and then rely on that to keep us funded would never work. Not now. It might have 10 or 20 years ago, but it doesn't now. Well, the most, the most successful membership program is Prime, right? And, you know, it's $99 a year and you get videos and you get delivery and you get groceries and you get, you know, so imagine, you know, in order, that's, that's, and, and so many of the businesses you work with are solo entrepreneurs. They're making choices about, they think more like consumers than businesses, right? So they think about if I'm an entrepreneur and I need to pay a membership, what am I going to get out of it? Prime gives me all of this. What is the chamber going to get me compared to that, right? If, and it's $99 only. Like that is really the, the, the way you need to really think about these things. Something I didn't think we were going towards because I, 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 so no it it is interesting okay um so what did you say your you went down to what is your so what what did when does it get to 500 bucks what what do you have any members that uh-huh wow okay and so what is what has happened to your budget? Um, guess what? We are closing in four months and we have broken fundraising records because I am no longer with my staff and my rules. Okay, so really you... Instead, instead of meeting, having a mixer, meeting an entrepreneur, do you like the chamber? Let me make a phone call. It's 250. Oh, and here's the application. And here's that person now goes to a corporation, tells them, I have a great program for the construction industry. We need $25,000 for you. Why do I need, I don't need the $500. I need, I need 25,000, right? So, and, and if the business wants to participate, guess what? You can apply for the program, but if we accept you, you need to become a member. And we're just getting people to become members because they want to participate in the program and it's worth 20 cents a day for them to do so. So we have a special membership um, for new members that has less than five employees, they will be free. So then we go to the corporation and ask them to pay for them. That's an alternative as well, right? I think I think what we're hearing here is that people are thinking about that. I've often thought of the subscription type membership, so you don't spend the 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 time and effort on the renewal basis, right? Mm -hmm. That somehow you get their card and it's a discounted membership or something like that, and you don't have to remember, you know, you don't have to invoice them, you don't have to call them. But may, yeah, this is interesting, Shannon. We're going to have good discussion about this later on. This is pretty interesting. You need to do the, the membership revenue analysis. Don't go and do that without doing a proper analysis. Whatever, you know, you know how you tell your businesses, do the analysis and the projections. I'm telling you, go do the analysis and the projections. Don't sue me because you lost all the money and then we have a problem. <laughs> and you would be the last one because. Yeah, I'm the last one. Okay, guys. Uh, so I'm from Oakland, California, and what we did in Oakland is that uh, our membership is $150, and so what we decided to do is if any new business that's been in business less than 12 months, we charge them $75, not $150. And then we created a scholarship for those businesses who were affected by the pandemic, so they get free one-year membership. So we'll deal with it and the renewal. Now, other organizations that I belong to, have an automatic renewal. So you pay you 150 and then and they tell you and you gotta uh, say yes, they'll renew automatically on your credit card. So we're gonna do that in our chamber later on. Also during the pandemic, we, we created, we, we got a CARES grant. So we, we created a newsletter, we hired staff and we uh, created a list of Latino restaurants in Oakland. So we have a list of over 100 restaurants right now. So I've gotten, I've gotten some good ideas of how to take that and market it now. Because I was like, wait a minute, we have a list, we created, we keep promoting it, but we're not making money off of it. So thanks very much. Yes, you have the assets, monetize them. 
Anyway, thank you so much, everybody. I hope this was a rich discussion for you. It was really fun for me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for the great information and presentation. So moving on to our next presenter. She is a, also a very well reputable lady in the chamber world. She's a strong Latina entrepreneur businesswoman who has also been the president of a woman owned locally small business. Uh, she has a deep understanding of the community. She's very passionate about chamber life and she has been a great help of our organization. I'd like to welcome Ms. Shannon Hawkes. Well, hello, everybody. Are we hanging in there still? Have we had a good day? Have we learned some great stuff today? I hope everybody's taking notes, and I was taking notes and texting my boss over there in the corner. <laughs> I know, lots of good stuff. Every now and then something strikes a chord, right? Well, my name is Shannon Hawkins. I'm the Chief Development Officer at this Vano Chamber. I think I should have a clicker in my hand, I'm guessing, right? Okay, great. And so um, when I was talking with Hope, um, and I'm excited that I'm following Jennifer because a lot of what she said is we're going to break it down to smaller, uh, smaller ideas and, and amounts of how you can raise money, uh, additional avenues of revenue, especially during and after COVID, because we're still in COVID technically, and we're still facing the we're not fully open, we're not 100% doing things in person. A lot of, uh, along the lines of a lot of what Jennifer said. So Jennifer, my three, our three R's for what our campaign was, was reset, recover, rebound. Uh, we went into immediate action and did the um, Hispano helps. And uh, so we, we completely understand and we went straight for that. For us, that was a big deal. So um, I think that uh, uh, you are right on. We're all right on. We all have these great ideas. And the point of being here is to collaborate. And most important, finding a balance between cutting expenses, but also increasing your revenue while staying creative and always following the mission. And we've discovered now that during COVID, following our mission is really important. And, and does it fit the mission? And so we've said no a few times, uh, which not all chambers do. You get the opportunity to get some money or an opportunity for a program, but does it fit the mission? So that's going to be really important today while we talk. So there's lots of ways that you can raise money or continue to pull money uh, from the chamber um, during your, um, uh, your practices. So I'm going to move this way so I don't um, get in front of everybody here. So traditional, how do we do that? We do that with membership, sponsorship, and events. We've always done that. I'm pretty sure everybody in here has that model. Uh, membership, sponsorship, and events, that's what we do. That's necessary to keep us in business. Um, over the last 10 years, chamber models obviously have been challenged. Are we still relevant? Is the old model working? Jennifer just challenged us <laughs> with a new way of thinking. So, you know, we went to a more modern approach. We, we went a little more programmatic, started reaching out, doing some community partnerships. And for us in particular, one of the things we did was naming rights. We went, uh, how can we use our campus uh, to draw some more dollars? And then this year, the last 18 months, if you will, we've gone really creative. Uh, those whiteboard sessions that Jennifer talks about is something we do regularly. And do we have an idea of how we can be a little different, be a little more creative in how we're going to raise money moving forward and still be relevant in the community? And we did that with grants, some programs that are a little bigger than our state that we're going to talk about, and then just a little bit of diversity and inclusion because we've all been facing that this year as well. Okay, so the traditional avenues of revenue, we've talked about that. Your membership, um, you know, one of our board members, um, fantastic lady says all the time, clarity is kind. So I love that we're having this conversation about membership because membership really is community. What works for your community, what does not? And one of the things that worked for our community um, has been the way that we structured our membership. However, we all saw that drop in membership um, fees, I mean, uh, membership enrollment or membership renewals during COVID. So we decided that we would take maybe 
uh, reach out to some of the sponsors that we would normally reach out to for our galas and say, hey, we still need those dollars. What could we do? So what we did was we created a program called Buen Vecinos. And with that program, when we would reach out for those renewals, if somebody said, I just can't renew at this time, you got to go into our Buen Vecinos program, which had some criteria you had to follow. You had to be on a committee. You had to, you know, engage, maybe speak at an event, even though it was virtual. But we, we gave them those opportunities, and then we paid the membership for the year to help them out. And we're still in the middle of that. We're actually still fundraising for that because it turned out to be so good. We want to continue that year round because it was a pandemic now, but what's going to happen next year, next time, what have you. So we want to continue that. Sponsorships. You know, one of the things that we like about sponsorships is they help us in the moment, but we've discovered that year round sponsorship is best. So something we like to do is do a package, pretty much say, okay, thank you for your 10,000 for this, 5,000 for that, 3,000 for that, and 2,500 for your membership or whatever it is. But hey, all together, that's 20,000 a year. They don't see it at the time, but when you offer them a way that they can pay 5,000 a quarter or 1,000 a month or whatever it breaks down to, you can actually engage and get more money that way. So sponsorship has kind of been restructured. And then of course, events. Have we reinvented the events because now we're going virtual. And uh, so we still have to create that exciting experience for people and for the, uh, the consumer, for the member, for our partners, whoever that may be. But are we doing it in a way that is fun and creative? So there are no bad ideas. There's just bad follow through. And we, we found this out during COVID because our phones rang off the hook to the point where we were getting messages and social media messages all night, year, all 24 hours a day. It was crazy. Our members needed us. Just like Jennifer said, you had to go into quick action. And that's what we did by, like I said, the beginning of April of last year, we, we had the Hispano Helps. But how hard is it to follow through when you have limited capacity? I don't know how large everybody's chambers are, and we're a fairly large chamber, and we are limited by our capacity. So I can imagine what everybody was feeling. And so we had to come up with ways to get these questions answered and followed through. So um, on the membership, uh, you know, one thing that we've always done is we've charged an application fee. When we did the math, we realized how much uh, dollars we were getting on our membership application fee. And the reason we charge that application fee is pretty simple. We have a platform. I don't know how many of you use a membership platform, but we have a platform that's very, very engaging to the membership. They have press release boards that automatically, all they got to do is put the information in. It goes straight to the media. They don't even have to call and search for who the media is. We do all the work for you. Um, there is events calendars, there's marketing tools, there's, I mean, it's very robust. And so the idea behind it was, wow, this application fee really helps to cover those costs. Um, do you offer specials to your members? So we saw that during COVID, a lot of members were reaching out going, I have a discount, I'll do a buy one, get one, like any way that they could drive traffic and we could help them. And so we realized that there was some larger companies that were offering that, but hey, if you want to get in our distribution list of 10,000 people, if you want us to do something in front of the camera for you, there's a little cost to that. Do you offer advertising in your weekly newsletters? Same concept. Because you have businesses now that are reaching out going, oh, um, and maybe they're mid-level businesses. We're not talking about the mom and pops, the little HPEs. We're talking mid-level businesses. There's a charge for that. Like Jennifer said, charge. I agree. Don't get out of bed for less than $10,000 a day. We're running organizations. We need the dollars. We can't be afraid to ask. And we can't be afraid of no, because we're going to get a lot of no's even if, uh, before we get the yeses. And have your dues been increased? Again, going back to the Buen Vecinos program, it wasn't about increasing the dues. It was about doing what we were going to do right when COVID started in January of 2020. And instead we were able to use the Buen Vecinos money to get them to the level in which they needed. And so the next step will be to hopefully next year, get them to pay that themselves if they're able to. Uh, sponsorships. Um, we have year round partners. So instead of walking up to a Coca-Cola and saying, hey, can you give us X dollars for our gala? Instead now, what we're saying is, can you give us this amount? And this is going to cover everything we do all year. This is going to cover our signature events, a program, a, you know, whatever it is that we have going on. So we have a list and we put that together. And that tends to help them a little bit understand more about being involved. And it also helps them be involved year round. So if you're working with a bank, if you're working with a, 
a big restaurant chain or whoever it is that you're working with on the corporate level, try to get them involved year round. Because if they get their name in, uh, somebody said ribbons, we die for ribbons, I heard it. They'll tend to be a little bit more involved and give you a little bit more. So that's important. Um, for us, something else we did during COVID, and we had done it before, but we pushed for COVID, was uh, what we call DFBs, daily flash briefs. 15 minutes in the morning, each of our departments, we had like membership Monday, tourism Tuesday, programs Wednesday, um, whatever it was, Thursday and Friday, fun Friday. And what we would do is we would do a 15 minute brief on what's happening in the community, what's happening in the membership, what's happening at the chamber that day. And if that day was Zoom or virtual, that's fine. But everybody knew to stay tuned to the page. And I love when I see Florida get on and I can be all, hi, Florida, we see you today. And people were actually watching us and, um, and learning what's happening locally. Because what are you going to do at home? You're at home and you're Zooming all day. So something fun to do. And then the other thing that we did was, again, because we were not going to have big events, we figured, wow, guess what, Square and Twitter or whoever you may be working with, we're going to offer you the same thing for your $10,000, but in a bigger way. We're going to do a whole month and it's going to be sponsored by Square or whatever it was, New Mexico Mutual, Walmart, it doesn't matter who it is. And for $10,000, you're going to get three webinars a week. They can be your topics. They can be topics. You can bring your people on. We uh, garnered a pretty large following on our Zoom, if you will, our, our Zoom webinars. And we were able to collect that way instead of using just the gala, which is our big fundraiser a year. So we did that for all last year. It worked out quite well and we had a good time with that. So I think it's something we should continue to do. Uh, again, things that we learned during COVID that are best practices moving forward. Um, events. So um, have you added revenue dr uh, driven events? It's hard. That's what we did with the webinars. That's what we did that worked for us. We had a good following. Uh, but be creative when you're thinking about those. Uh, have you increased your ticket prices? So this year, we actually increased our ticket prices. So we are going live with our first event in 18 months on October 15th, which is our annual Hispanic Heritage Awards. And we get about six to 700 people at the event. And we realized that... <laughs> the cost of doing an in-person event has gone through the roof. Supply chain, food, rentals, what have you. And so we increased our ticket price and we've actually had no problem selling tickets or tables. Um, we weren't afraid. We just threw it out there. Nobody has said anything. They've, they've done it, but it's nerve wracking to all of a sudden ask, ask for, for more money. We actually increased our gala ticket price too by $50. So we're not $250 a ticket. And again, people are biting. And I don't know if it's because we're all ready to get back in formals and get out in person and see people, uh, but we're pretty excited about that. Video promotions. That is huge for us. This year, we went, I mean, full on, full course video. Everything is video. We have a video pretty much on every one of our web pages. And what we do is we sell the rights to be on the video. And uh, we've noticed how many people, if you're, flipping through, say, Facebook, you'll probably stop and watch a video more than you'll probably read a post. So, yeah. <laughs> so video is huge right now. So we, we've gone full video, um, thanks to the gentleman standing over here to my right, but we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> and are you reinventing your event themes? Uh, maybe you were doing, um, uh, for us, it's our gala, our big gala that we do every year. And we have a new theme. This year is space. So for the next six months, all we're going to be talking about is what's happening in space in New Mexico. That's a big theme for us. It also is a draw to bring in new companies, space companies, technology companies, maybe people that would not have companies that would not have other, otherwise thought of the chamber or the Hispano chamber to partner with. So we're going to watch a video here. Uh, forgive me because this is, uh, you know, the videos from our websites. Uh, but again, these are types of videos. Uh, that you can ask for uh, $10,000 or whatever it is that works for your chamber to put their logo on it because it gets seen hundreds and thousands of times throughout the year. The Albuquerque Hispano Chamber of Commerce. Join, connect, thrive. We believe in contributing to a greater cause. We believe when opportunity knocks, you should answer the door. 
We believe your success is our success. We believe in the entrepreneurial dream. We believe in winning together. We believe we connect the right people to the right people. That passionate people make things happen. That small business is critical to growing our economy. We believe in big smiles and friendly handshakes. We believe in having fun. We believe an educated workforce is vital and knowledge is power. We believe it's important to know who you are and where you came from. We believe Albuquerque is red and green, fry bread, bizcochitos, turquoise, mariachis, the mesa, the bosque, and the sandias. We believe that most people are one connection away from achieving their dreams. The Albuquerque Hispano Chamber of Commerce, a place where people and business thrive. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> so I, my question really is, a video like this that's put on your website, could you approach a corporate sponsor for ten or twenty thousand dollars? That video gets played, I mean, our website, we get close to a million hits a month, and it's mostly because we're very integrated in our website. So what is that worth to somebody? What is that worth to a corporate sponsor to have their logo in the front, their logo in the back, and maybe a voiceover that says, thank you to Wells Fargo, or whatever it may be. So important. So we just covered membership, sponsorship, and events. Um, those are the traditional. And I know we're going to move into some more creative stuff, but does anybody have any thoughts on what you're doing now and you know how we're maintaining that traditional because that's important to who we are as a chamber model even though we have to grow a little bit of what you're currently doing anybody Mm-hmm. <laughs> more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and you know it's so funny because you're you're absolutely right on programs and we we're going to talk about that now. We've really pushed our programs, but what's funny is they still want to get out and they want to do those things. So could you package, hey, can you be my ten or fifteen thousand dollars sponsor for this program and I'll get you a table to the gala? So they're still getting their name out, but it's just how you approach it. It's you know whatever works for your chamber. Uh, but that's that's the best way to do it is offer them as much as you can. They like they do like their name and lights. We know that, and that's what they're that's what they get paid to do. That's the money, that's what the money's for. So some reinventing of the new modern chamber model. Programs, are your programs relevant? So we've had to change. Everybody knows that the small, the HBE, the LOB, whatever you refer to your small businesses as has changed. It's a whole different ownership over the past 10 years. Um, community partners, how are you partnering with them? Are we thinking outside of the box? Are we being strategic? You know, you want to hit a, a, a bank, for instance, but is it working with their mission? If we're going to them and saying, can I get $10,000 and it's not their mission, then it's different if you go and you find out what their missions are and ask for fifteen dollars or $20,000. So know your, know your audience, do your homework before you ask. And do you have a program that is either already in place or one that you can create or repurpose, um, as Jennifer said, so that you could ask for more money? Super important. And then naming rights. So 
we have a large campus and we're very blessed to have that. But as I walk through the patio, I was telling Ernie, you know, we have these beautiful columns and we have these benches all over the patio. And what are we not getting dollars for? 2,500 here, 5,000 there, 3,500 here. That all adds up. We've named our boardrooms, our lobbies, our kitchens, some of the offices. But are we really squeezing all those dollars out? And what we're finding is that right now, some of those small businesses that were maybe not as affected during COVID, some of those legacy businesses, the ones that have been in your community for like 50 years, you know, and they're doing really well, they can afford the $3,500 and the $5,000. And they want their name. And they want to come to your place and say, oh, I did that. That's me, you know. So um, we've worked on that as well. So um, we always have the desire to grow and scale. That's part of who we are. That's part of our small businesses and what they do. So for programs, so we have a new program that's going to get kicked off. And we kind of had been playing with this a little bit right around when COVID hit. But now we've really played with it quite a bit and pushed into it. It's called the Business Opportunity Program or the Biz Ops Program for short. We're going to kick that off in January of 2022. Now, here's the deal with the program. We reached out basically to the membership and we said, you know, what, what, what do you need? What don't we have? Blah, 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 blah. And we came back with, you know, a million answers. And so we took all of those and we put them down on a whiteboard and we realized that it's really the basics of what everybody wants to know with maybe a little bit of, you know, sprinkles and cherries on top. And so this is a 52-week program. So what happens you come to the chamber and you need financial, and maybe that's access to capital, maybe that's balancing your sheets at the end of the month, um, who knows what the different topics are. And what we did was we labeled everything by the month. So one month is financial, one month is HR, one month is marketing, and there's traditional marketing and there's social media marketing, so that's actually two months. And within those months, we'll take social media for an example, one week is Twitter, one week is Instagram, one week is whatever platform you're using, uh, Facebook. And we just have the membership teach that. So the membership comes in, they get to own that, they get to brand it, you know, sponsored by whatever. And uh, we don't have to do anything. They get to use the boardroom. It's scheduled on the same day or the same week of every month. They can be virtual and or in person, up to them. But then we went out and sold the program to one of our national labs who paid us for the program, for their name to be on the marketing, basically, and on the web page. And uh, that's going to be a benefit to the client, to the member, uh, for, for, um, for them to come every day, I mean, every week if they want, or pick the ones that work for them. But again, there's no staff time in it because your members are teaching it. So that's coming in 2022. Our One Room at a Time initiative, um, I'm not sure how many different departments everybody has within their chambers, but we have a convention and tourism department that we have had. It's a uh, contract with the city that we've had for over 40 years to promote in the Hispanic and Native American markets. And so obviously tourism, one of the biggest hit uh, industries during COVID. So we figured how in the heck are we going to meet the deliverables of our contract when we can't have people coming to our city? We can't promote, promote conventions and conferences and marketing. Um, for tourism. So what we did was we did these little side weekends, a weekend, a day, drive away, Albuquerque, and we started going with in-state tourism and promoted this one room at a time. And it really helped us get through the rough time of our, our tourism contract. And, and now we're back to normal, but that was tough, but we were creative. We sat in a room and we did a whiteboard and we said, how are we going to get people into there? Well, we're going to do it one room at a time. And that became our our hashtag for that. Um, our membership industry program, I'm going to skip forward for a second. So during this time, we, again, we're talking to a lot of our members. And, you know, I remember having a conversation with somebody who goes, you know, I'm fine being a member, but you don't do anything for technology. I don't know what's going on. I mean, it'd be nice to have a, a weekly brief or a monthly what's going on. And as we started going through, we started finding these people, our members were very focused on their industry. And, um, we already had a lot of this in place, so we've just added a few. Each of these programs is run by a committee, a committee member, a chair, um, excuse me, a committee chair, vice chair, secretary, treasurer, all run by the membership. We don't have to do anything other than make sure that the space is available for their monthly meeting, which is really nice. But then 
we went out and said to the corporate sponsors of the world, hey, um, Tricor Industries, you're a, a health and wellness testing laboratory. And for the low price of $3,500, we'll put your name on this for the, for the year. And so that gives the committee some money to start to kick off the program. We let them manage it. We, we've already done the marketing for it. So as they make, um, oh, let's say they're going to create a new event or a new a meeting of some sort, the marketing's in place for them. But now, instead of going and knocking on doors and going, this is this mono chamber, and we do all of this. We can focus on what their industry is. And it's much easier, I believe, I don't remember who said it, but maybe it, maybe it was you, just one or two or three things that you do at your chamber, keeping it short, this will help you. So when somebody says, oh, your health and wellness program, oh, it's, you know, you're going to work with like-minded individuals, people that are in your industry, and you're going to be able to work with a committee that knows the needs right now of that industry. And all of a sudden, they're like, that's exciting. So we don't have to share with them the 85 million things that we do as a chamber, right? You're just getting them in one focus. The good news is when they start getting out and they start meeting people, they're going to learn about everything else we do. And we don't have to try to sell it so hard. We can just say that is what works for you. So that's the, the membership programs. But I bring this up because for dollars, we have all of these sponsored. And that's the goal. The goal is the dollars, the bigger dollars. And then uh, the last one is our La Escaleta program. So what happened was during COVID, again, we were like, wow, we're not going to get to celebrate our 45th birthday, our 45th anniversary of being the Hispano Chamber. How are we going to honor our legacy, our founders, the people that have built us from the ground up? And so what we did was we have this really nice staircase with these bricks on the wall. And one day I was walking up the wall and I told Ernie, can't we put some plaques on this wall? What can we do on this wall? And I think there was 700 and some plaques on the wall. And I thought, well, let's raise $45,000 for our 45th anniversary. And so now we have these beautiful plaques on the wall that cost us, of a, I don't know, about six or seven bucks a piece, but we charge 250 and we've got 700 and some bricks available. So it's just an easy way. It's pretty when you walk up the stairs, it's got all the plaques on there and it's a lot of fun. But again, an interesting way to fundraise during COVID. And all we did was send out an email and then they started applying online and paying online. So it worked out really, really well. Oh, okay. So I think we have another video. So um, I wanted to bring up, and I, I used health and wellness, but that's because I didn't remember my own talk. Really wanted to talk, say for us, <laughs> it's because I couldn't remember what I was doing. I really wanted to talk about the Youth Entrepreneur Program because uh, we've all noticed, if you haven't, it, it's coming up if you haven't seen it already, there's a whole new wave of young Hispanic business entrepreneurs out there with amazing ideas. So how do we, how do we help and capitalize at the same time on these really great ideas they have. So again, we went out and we sold those programs for about 3,500 bucks. And part of that program means that we're gonna create a video for the sponsor. The beauty of it is what you're gonna see is, is the video, but notice there's none of our logos in it yet. So what we did was we're giving our sponsor an amazing video that he can now take and use all over. He doesn't have to pay for it. He doesn't have to design it. He doesn't have to work with anybody. We just sent him a great video company to do so. But now for us, when it goes on the website, we brand it with our logo on front and back. So he's real appreciative because he gets to use it, but we get to brand it and we got his money for it. So it's really a win-win.
so quick and to the point, a minute and 30 seconds. Um, and I just want to say something about this particular company. You know, they've been a, a they were headquartered in Albuquerque, a hidden little gem. And at uh, USHCC two years ago, when it was hosted in Albuquerque, he got involved through USHCC. And he'd been a member of the chamber for a long time. We just hadn't done the reach out. So we did the reach out and two little over two years later, he's one of our biggest partners. And so you never know who you're going to connect with who's next door to you at your at a national conference. So talk to everybody. That's the that's the key there. Yeah. Uh, oh, I was going to save it to the end, but <laughs> I have one more video. I'm going to save it. But again, we're talking about videos that cost a few hundred dollars. If you're getting $10,000 from somebody, invest five, six hundred or a thousand dollars in a video, whatever it may be, get a deal, find somebody to work with you because it's worth the investment. It's worth the client's time and energy to not have to go through the work. We did the work and we paid for it. So it's a, it's a really great tool. So we talked about our business opportunity program, our one room at a time and our La Scaletta. Replace that with your programs, you know, whatever works for you, but picking the three things that work for your chamber. So when you're talking about it, you have, oh, this is what we do in the back of your mind. I think I'm getting a dead battery here. Okay, we talked about community partners. So during COVID, we did a lot of reach outs. We thought, wow, you know what? What are we going to do in place of the gala? How are we going to make more partnerships? Uh, one of them is we went to our local sports teams. Now we are not Las Vegas. We don't have the Raiders. We're not a major city that's got... Uh... <laughs> you had to, you had to. You, I was going to say, how much did they pay you for that? <laughs> no less than 10 grand. But we do have incredible local teams to Albuquerque that are doing really, really great stuff. And not just Albuquerque, all of New Mexico. Um, we're actually very proud of one of our partnerships with, uh, with our baseball team, the uh, Isotopes, um, who is... Um, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure some of you have the same program in the cities you're in, but, you know, five times a year, they change their name, and it was all in an effort to raise awareness in the Hispanic community and getting more people to the games in the Hispanic community, and um, this is through the Pacific Coast League for us in Albuquerque, and they become the Mariachis in Nuevo Mexico five times a year, and so we sponsor, we support, we help them. We draw traffic to them. They draw traffic to us. It's become a really, really big deal. And we reached out to all of them. We have, a, you know, a, a, our uh, indoor arena football team, our Lobos, which is, you know, the UNM University for us, our Lobos, and then the United Soccer Team, which is really big where we're, where we're at um, in soccer. So we just partnered with all of them. It doesn't, doesn't take a lot. It's what we're already doing. Like she said, just repurpose what you're already doing and put a logo and a name on it. Um, we also started the Small Business Center of New Mexico. So you can see our four logos up there on the right side. Those are the teams we're working with. On the other side, the little wheel, the little spinnies there, the little rounds, we started what we call the Small Business Center of New Mexico. Again, we have a large campus, and through that, we thought, wow, who do we already have in our campus, and who can we bring to the campus? And for us, lease, rental is income, so that was a positive thing for us. But we have an MBDA office in our campus. We also have a PTAC office in our campus. We also have an SBDC office in our campus. We also have a PPE office. This is a program we actually had with the city. And I know that you guys are probably going, wow, PPE, but let me tell you, this mono chamber in Albuquerque got over a half a million masks. We were generously donated to by some of our bank um, sponsors, and they literally just were shipping semi-loads of supplies to us. And so we did huge PPE drives, and they were literally drives. You had to drive through the parking lot, and you got to stop at like six stations and pick up your supplies. And then we had local vendors come in. I mean, uh, local members come in, and they were stuffing bags with freebies of stuff. And it was really exciting. So now we have it on our website. If you'd like to get free PPE supplies, you can register, and our manager of that program will call you back and get you boxes of PPE. And who would have thought that after the Delta... I mean, after the first round of COVID that you would need those again, but now we have the Delta. And so we started picking up again a couple of months ago on that. Um, we also have um, our Be Well NM. Uh, so 
again, during COVID, creativity, looked at our mission. Our mission says outreach and education. Doesn't necess necessarily say education and what, but it says outreach and education. So we applied for, um, for a contract with the state of New Mexico to push out um, health insurance. And our, our plan in New Mexico is called the Be Well New Mexico, Be Well NM plan. And so we were very, very excited. We put this together. It was in the height of the pandemic, crossing our fingers that we would get it. And lo and behold, on I believe December 28th or 9th, uh, Ernie got a phone call and says, congratulations, you won the contract. We start in two days. And so that required a lot. That required hiring staff it required remodeling, uh, you know, our downstairs. It required a lot, but we did it. And we're very proud. It's about a $3.5 million contract, give or take. And we're all over New Mexico. So the great news is we're taking the word of the chamber out to the masses, along with educate, educating about health insurance and the importance of making sure your staff is covered. We're reaching out to small businesses and saying, hey, if you don't have a medical plan in place or you can't afford one, you could apply with this because a lot of times you, you get it for low or no cost. So now we're helping the small businesses offer insurance. So it's become a super plus plus for us. So um, again, just an example of some fun programs. And then naming rights, events, programs, campus, anywhere you can, like, like we said, get out of bed for $10,000 a day. That's a sweet number for us. I love 12,000 because when you break it down, it's $1,000 a month. It's $1,000 a month. So when somebody says, I want to get involved, I'm like, for $12,000 a year, you get this. So that's my big spiel. But um, again, don't be afraid to ask for the money, I think is the big thing here. So this is some examples of some of the programs that we do that are uh, sponsored or funded. Um, our big gala uh, that we do every year in February this year is Space Launching a Bowl Tomorrow. And so we're already working on that with a lot of space industries, and we're talking the minimum to come in is $10,000. So that's important. Uh, we do our Dia de los Muertos, which is our gala launch. Um, we have our golf tournament, our Hispanic Heritage Awards. And then we do have Avanzar, which has been great for us. And there's so many ways to repurpose that and add and bring in speakers and bring in other uh, leaders and instructors to help there. And then we also have our procurement series, which is really, really big. In New Mexico, we have a very unique landscape. We have um, two national laboratories, three Air Force bases, the Nuclear Weapons Center. We're very, very government dollar heavy in our state. And so our goal is we can help to grow and scale small businesses, Hispanic businesses, if they understand how to work with the government. So we have a six week series that we do twice a year. Once they've gone through that and graduated, we move them into MBDA. And um, hopefully the goal is to raise awareness and try to keep the dollars local if we can, um, teach them how to team and partner. So that's been real successful for us. So we're talking real quick about creative avenues of revenue. We had to be creative this year. Pivot, pivot, pivot. I'm sure everybody hates that word. My staff hates that word. I love that word. I use it every day. Uh, but we've had to. We've had to be creative and pivot. So um, for grants, are we thinking outside the box? Has anybody ever thought about going like regional or national with a program you have right from your own little chamber? And let's talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion and what that means to your mission and what that means to your future. Um, innovation is going to help us increase our revenue while being inclusive to the community, which we all know is extremely important right now. So we have a great little platform and um, it's called Foundation Search. And this program is really awesome because what it does is it allows you to create uh, your own grant. I want a grant to help us, you know, design that wall and do this and blah, blah, blah. And you put it all together and then like a grant, like you would, and you feed it into the system and it spits out to you who has funding available. And if there's no funding available, you can also reach out and ask if they could create funding around what you're looking for. Now, it's not an inexpensive platform by any means, but we got creative and asked our board 
to pay to help us out, and they did so. So we are taking full advantage of this. And I would recommend that with or without a platform like this, that you're reaching out and you're doing research and you're checking on Google constantly for what dollars are available out there. Because right now, there is a lot of money. And we didn't really apply for like ARPA or CARES Act money at the chamber. We really focused on grants that were out and available in the specific industries. Mm -hmm. No, we, we, we did the PPP. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Amira's right. There is so much money out there right now. Right now, we don't have excuses. It's the time to be ready for sure. Um, so we reached out and we, yep. Yes. We reached out to the board and we said, hey, can we get some help? Because it's an expensive platform. But just again, it's an idea of how do we get this out? How do we get help? If we have access to hundreds of thousands of dollars, but we can't access it, for a few bucks, how can we be creative and go around that to make it happen? Tech soup. And it's, and, and again, that's one platform. There's so many. I mean, when you're, you're sitting there going, I have a few minutes to myself, just Google. You would be surprised what you can come up with. There's so many foundations out there. There is Kellogg and Disney and UPS. And I mean, we could go on and on about the foundations out there that have money. And are you applying? Are you going, oh, five, 10,000? All of that adds up. All of it helps. Want to talk really quick about a, a program that we're going to launch, and I and I'm I'm saying all of this because I want everybody to think big, think bigger than your chamber, think bigger than you. You know, we're we're we cover the state, and we do have members outside of our state, but we really are looking to expand and really help small businesses. And like they said, it's not always about membership; it's it's about what you can offer. It's about what are the perks of being included in a family, in a chamber family, because you know chambers are very different. It takes a certain kind of person to work in a chamber and to be involved in a chamber, and we're a chamber family, so go big or go home. So with the help of the video, the gentleman in the video that you saw just a minute ago, um, he approached us and said, you know, I'm a very blessed 33-year-old uh, successful businessman, and I need, I need, I think his words were, I need to give back. How can we do that? Well, his expertise is in government contracting. And so as we sat there and did our famous whiteboarding sessions, we've come up with the um, Southwest Regional 8A Association that we're going to be launching in January of 2022. And the reason we're excited about that is because it took off like literally overnight, a mind of its own. We've had uh, two meetings already with SBA in DC. Uh, we just solidified our first big partner, um, Dene Development Corporation, to come in. What we did was we found an industry that really needed support. It was just accidental, but we did it. And now we're moving on it. We're working hard. We want to teach people the importance of having an 8A designation or a minority or a special designation, a hub zone, a women-owned, a service-disabled veteran-owned. What will that do to your business? In turn, what will that do to the chamber? What will that do to your membership and how you grow if you give them that opportunity? And so it's been really exciting. So if you have somebody that's passionate, maybe has a little bit of seed money, or maybe just really big creative ideas, get with them. Create something that works. Create a new idea and push really, really hard for it if you believe in it. And we did. We pushed hard. We believe in it. And uh, it's going to be important, I think, to not just Albuquerque or even our chamber, but to the community. And so um, if you happen to be in these territories, you're going to hear from us <laughs> to reach out. Because it's important that we all share best practices uh, from, from you know, our areas. And that's how we learn and grow with each other. So that's super important. Now I want to talk a second about um, diversity and inclusion. So um, we've learned a lot this year, a whole lot this year, and I think it's important that we continue to um, adapt to the new world that we're in, the new words 
we have to use and the new ways in which we have to do that work. Um, it's uncomfortable. It's hard sometimes. We say things wrong and it's okay. I've had to ask forgiveness a lot because <laughs> I don't know everything. And so it's hard sometimes. But through this, through this time, we as a chamber have come together and had some talks and always going back to our mission, always going back to our mission of education and, um, and commerce and, and how does that fit together? And um, so we begin to focus really on the main mission for us, which is, which is probably for all of you, commerce and growing your community. But how do we do that? How do we do that in this world that we live in? So we have applied for a grant. Um, and in applying for that grant, we got really specific in the actual wording and actually how we laid out the grant. And um, we developed a, a concept which we hope to launch in the future called the Race to Success Institute. How does race affect your race? So in a nutshell, how does the color of your skin affect the journey that you have in life? And if we can if we can meet at a certain level, oh, our moms went to high school together, or oh, that's my favorite restaurant, or whatever it may be, then we don't see this. But how do we get to, how do we teach that at a young age? So our idea is that we're going to, you know, maybe 12, 13 year olds, who we bring them into a space, an actual institute, if you will, bring them into a space where they're comfortable to ask those questions. And then we're going to add in some education and some curriculum, maybe in the areas that they don't get in school anymore. Maybe it's trades. We all know that's a tough one right now. Maybe it's financial literacy. I mean, do kids know how to balance checkbooks, check, checkbooks these days? Um, whatever it may be, there's a whole curriculum involved. But we've got to do it in a way that is sensitive, but also powerful. And so we created a great group of people to come together to help us launch this program. And uh, we're pretty excited about it. So we're going to show you a quick video on it. I think it's next, right? Yeah. You know, you know, Myra, I'm glad you said that because when we made the video, I have to tell you, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to give credit here in just a second. But when we made the video, I said, if we don't make Ernie cry, then we did not do our job. So we needed to make sure that we got a tear out of his eye. And so, you know, we get back to the concept of the videos. You can make so much money with the videos. I can't, exp I cannot tell you enough. You can have any corporate person, I mean, corporate member attach their logo to a video that takes a minute and a half. And you can play that anywhere. You can open every event, you can open every Zoom, every webinar, every in-person with a video. And so I wanna give credit to Syndicate Media, who's local to Albuquerque, Julian, who's here all the way from Albuquerque, to help us with videos all weekend, because we're doing videos to talk about the National Conference and the amazing speakers and what does the chamber, the Hispanic chamber community do across the country. This is important, it's not just about Albuquerque or Philadelphia or Florida. It's literally about the community itself. 
And so I would encourage you to find a great video uh, team in your city or in your, in your community and, and work with that. So those are just a few of the things that we're doing at the chamber. And so we have, a lot of, we have a lot of stuff going on, but what we have is a really great enthusiastic staff. We've seen a change, I think, in, in shifting um, staff um, attitude. People have, be, I feel like they've got, come together more and uh, they collaborate better. Uh, during COVID. And so I think that that's been important. So we have about five or seven minutes left. Um, that's the end of my presentation, but I want to talk with you all. Let's start throwing some, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, let's start throwing some ideas out there. What are you guys doing during this time uh, to help build and drive avenues of revenue into your chambers? Pablo, <laughs> I just had to pick on you because you're right there. Anybody, I know you guys ha all have great programs. I know you all have stuff going on. So what are some of the things that you're doing? Well, we we uh, just recently had a, a tri-chamber event where we got together with uh, Essex County, with Hudson County Chamber of Commerce, and we had a networking event. Mm -hmm. And we raised money and we split the money evenly between the three chambers. So collaboration, that's huge. We love to collaborate. We're all about collaboration. The more people, the better. That's huge. And if you can attach dollars to it, even better. So that's huge. What else are you guys doing? Florida had some great stuff. I know you did. We talked about it. We had a virtual event called Women del Mañana for Women's Month. Uh, the virtual the event itself sold it was completely sold out. We had over 55 women in attendance, fully engaged because we were, you know, like testing them and questioning throughout the whole program. So it was super exciting. And then that afternoon, we have we had a Women del Mañana in the arts. So what we did is that we actually reached out to the community, to members and non-members, and said, "Hey, if you're an artist, please reach out." As a result, we had about 10 artists that had never shown their art. I, get, I still get moved from it. And um, one of the artists, actually, um, she applied to a program that was used as the unveil or kickoff for Hispanic Heritage Month. So to me, why is this so exciting is because in Jacksonville, we're growing as a community. Right now we're 11.5%. And um, the mural itself really showcased who we are as a community. We're diverse in race, ethnicity, and backgrounds. And that really, what it, that's, that's what the, the mural itself was. So now this artist is getting the recognition. She got paid. The chamber is growing. And now we actually have sponsors that have increased their membership. So a program that started as a small idea is now taking it to next year to hopefully making it bigger. So we, we did notice during this time, the creative economy, a hugely hit uh, group of individuals, jewelry makers, dancers, entertainers, musicians, artisans. So if you can pull together a creative economy program of some sort to support, there's traffic into your membership as well as probably sponsorships. There's some dollars out there. Anybody else? One more. So uh, when we started Transformando West Michigan in 2018, uh, after we finished the cohort, I asked these 11 businesses, so what are your main struggles? Um, number one was accounting. Number two was human resources. Number three was customer service. So my background is, is public accounting. That's what I, that's my trade. Um, so we created uh, uh, cohorts within human resources, customer service, that, that wasn't an issue. But for two years, I was thinking, so how can I help Latino businesses to pretty much create an infrastructure for finance, which is the main barrier of access to capital within Latino businesses? they don't have financials, they don't have bookkeeping, they don't, they don't pay taxes, you know, that's the reality. So um, I pitched the idea to several foundations and during the pandemic, the WK Kellogg Foundation called me and, and said, you know, we have the money for you, you know, to start a program, no pressure. So whenever you um, uh, wanna do it, but we just want to let you know that there's this money. So what we're doing is we are gonna start accounting services through the West Michigan Hispanic Chamber of Commerce 
uh, where we pretty much put the financials in place for every Latino business that they want to do it. And we're going to charge below market rates. So long term, that's going to be a source of income for the Hispanic Chamber uh, because all of the businesses, we're going we're gonna to have like a small, you know, CPA firm within our organization. And we are being, our, our, our main partner is a, a large CPA firm in, in our region, in Grand Rapids. And they are pretty much supervising all of our operations, you know, within the accounting initiative. And we are not focusing on taxes, just basic bookkeeping and basic financials, you know, to pretty much organize finance infrastructure of businesses. Hope, do we have time for one more? Hope, Field, do we have time for one more? She's ignoring me. Oh, thank you. We have something it's called community care program. Do, with the community care program, uh, we have a lot of members that died. So we wrote tributes to them and we send care packages to their families. And that was good because, you know, they don't feel lonely. We also did the restaurant week with um, Jennifer. That was her idea from Philadelphia. And that was very successful in Morris County. And right now we're doing uh, the police and the chamber and the community. We're doing a, a networking meeting because the community has been inside and they are afraid to speak to the police, especially those that are uh, undocumental. So now the, the police, the chief and everybody else, they're going to meet together to let them know that it's okay to talk to the police. Okay, all that is my time. So, oh, we have one more. Oh, one more. Do we have time for one? We do. Okay. Oh, you. I was. I was thinking we had one minute. And, minute. and and seriously, so what I'm about to say may not flow with what was, has been said. Doesn't matter because I think every chamber and every community is unique and different and different set of circumstances. And so, what I want to say is. Um, and I'm not gonna air out dirty laundry, but I took over a chamber that was a little bit financially in trouble. I come from the business sector. And what I know what we do well is the basics. We are, and we don't apologize for this, we are a membership chamber. My job is to show you why you should be a member. I raised our uh, membership, no longer accept the $295 membership. Ours start at 500 and go up to 25. And I don't mean this in an arrogant way. It's about confidence. It's about really showing uh, uh, people that want to hand you a check why you're relevant, why they should be part of your chamber. That's our job to do that. That's, that's why I feel is my job to do that. And because of that, our membership has grown through the roof, and we're 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 in a position that we just can't believe we're in right now. And and I'll tell you a couple of things that we did to to show that we are relevant and why you should be a member of this chamber. You can look across the street. Allegiant Stadium doesn't happen or certainly doesn't get, maybe doesn't happen without the Latin Chamber of Commerce and the Laborers Union in this town. Why? Because we get involved in politics. At the Latin Chamber, we're not afraid to mix it up with politics, with mix it up with elected officials. They know my, and, and, and I'll tell you, and, and that has generated the most growth in my members. They come to me because they know they're going to have help uh, when they go in front of uh, city, state, uh, municipalities for things that they need. So I, I think that's a great way to be relevant. I'll, and I'll leave you with this. The other thing we did is my staff knows that every person we come in contact with comes, becomes part of my database. So, yeah, I want my members, and we, we have over 1,700 now. I think, we had, I think we had like 600 when I started. Our database though, I have over 25,000 emails. What does that mean? That means the elected officials, they know that I can send out messaging and it makes us very powerful. And that has hit our bottom line. Our bottom line, it's not a coincidence, continues to grow as we do these things, getting involved in things that other chambers are a little uncomfortable doing. Lastly, listen, this country doesn't function without Latinos without Hispanics. We have to stop acting like we're pobrecitos. And while a bank gives 100,000 to the white chamber in the, in the community, gives us five. I turned it down last year. I turned down their 5,000 and said, I know you gave 100 down the street. So 
come talk to me another time because I don't need the five. We got to conduct ourselves that way as a chamber. When we do that, our board acts that way. We get confident and we get better. Thank you, Peter. Well, thank you, everybody. That is my time. Let me apologize. I know I talk fast, but um, I, I figured I was a high D until uh, Ernie says, no, no, you're a high, high D. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shannon. So we're going to go ahead and take a quick break for 15 minutes, and then we'll resume with our final presentation at 3 o'clock.
conflict if you had to choose which board would you choose because what you don't want and I'm sure everybody in here has experienced it is drama and it happens in boards and it happens when we are not openly communicating the worst thing is when something is bothering and we're like we just sit on it and we just sit on it and we sit on it, bring it up into the open and um one solution might be in um the law, we call it the Chinese wall. So if we have an attorney that's come over from another firm and now there's a case that that firm's working on, they're not allowed to see the file. They're not allowed. They can still work with us, but when it comes to that case, they have to have blinders on. So if it's just one grant or one issue, you can say, anytime we discuss this, we want you to leave the room. There's a conflict of interest, but it doesn't mean you can't be with us on everything else. So that's one potential solution. In Nevada, there can be criminal or civil penalties, depending on how egregious it is. Um, the main thing to really worry about, unless, you know, unless a director is being fraudulent or really egregiously negligent, there's not going to be a whole lot with the law. The issue is going to be with the IRS. If there's a big conflict of interest or an ongoing conflict of interest, the organization is going to lose its tax exempt status. So that's really where it's going to affect. Uh, I, I don't know that anybody would report, like you would, even if you knew it was happening, you wouldn't want to report it. You're not going to chop your board's foot off, but the IRS can audit at any time or ask quite, and that's where it comes to light. But yes, anybody who's not a friend of the chamber could report it and then the IRS is going to investigate. Yes, yes. I was wondering about like the grants conflict of interest that you're talking about. I was like, wait a minute, do you share with your whole board every time you're applying for a grant? Because we do more things like within our, within our executive board and among like the chairman and the director. And we don't, I mean, have a meeting for every grant we're going for because then I do feel like, like we have a board member that's on an organization that, you know, goes for similar grants and in a small city, they're like, oh, we'll do one today, we're the change, we're fine. You need to share with the board, but you can have an individual committee that's making those decisions. Like you can have a political committee that just that committee is making any decisions as far as who the chamber is going to back up or not. You can have a grants committee that is doing the applications and the inner workings. You're going to need to present to the board. We applied for a grant. You can't hide things from the board, but they don't have to be a part of the whole conversation. Correct. Um, generally, what committees should do is committees have um, approval to act, but not make decisions on their own. So what you would do is do all the investigation about the grant, maybe even do the application process, and then present it to the board for approval to accept the grant. Okay, perfect. <laughs> yes. Within your policies, so like in your PNPs, you can have it set up to where because we don't want to talk to our board about granting and help. We do every five, like every two months. We report this is what we received. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking in your PMPs, you could set it up that the executive, like the actual, the chamber leadership has the authority to, to fundraise. Yes. And then you'll just report to the board what funds we raise. Absolutely. And just kind of get board approval. Like I know here, um, the CEO and the board members will go out and gather members. We still vote on them to approve that they can come in as members. It's kind of a formality, but it's still a formality that's important. And so it's rare that a board's going to vote no on either a grant or a fundraising thing or accepting certain funds, but you never know what somebody might know where they might say, hey, we have a problem here. Political endorsement. What's your issue with that? <laughs> 
it's not fun, right? Because nobody's ever happy. <laughs> Well, if you're a C6, you have permission to do it. If you're a C3, so does everybody in here know the difference between a 501C6 and a 501C3? And so some organizations, their C6, their chamber is the one that does that. And then they have a 501C3 to gather donations for different projects that they're doing in town. So if you're not already doing that, that's a really great avenue to get the best of both worlds because they're managed two completely different ways. Um, it's really up to the chamber and it's, it's not fun because what you don't, you want to be nonpartisan, right? You don't want to, oh, they're Latino. So they're a democratic organization. That's not necessarily the case or they're business owners. So they're a Republican organization. So if you're going to do it, it's a good idea to really try to have a mix and to be able to endorse not the person or the party, but this is what we're endorsing about them. They're pro-business or they're pro-immigration, whatever it is that you're trying to endorse, really focus on that. But um, you need to have a, if you're gonna do it, you need to have policies and procedures in place on how you're going to select and how the board is gonna manage that because then infighting starts too, right? This person wants this candidate, this person wants this candidate. And so if as a board, you decide to endorse political candidates, even if you personally don't like it, you can't go running at the mouth that I didn't agree with that, I didn't like it. You have to appear united, you have to. So you either have to decide as a chamber, you're gonna do it or you're not gonna do it. And if you're gonna do it, you really have to have strong policies. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, because they're a C three. Yeah, it, it's it, it gets it gets messy. Mm -hmm. You need to be very specific that is doing with the C6 to avoid confusion. And I could say, oh, you are going to the C3, so I'm going to suspend you. I said, how, how could we make that different? Well, your 501C3 and your 501C6 have to have two different boards, right? We can't just all be sitting around the table and pretend, oh, right now we're the C3, and then right now we're the C6. You usually want to have one liaison. The board of directors needs to be completely different and the president needs to be, they need to be two completely separate organizations that are working together for a common cause. The CEO could be CEO for both? It's not best. Uh, CEO could be on the board so that there's some, like I so said, you can have liaisons, but you shouldn't have a person serving in the same capacity in both organizations. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. And so basically you have uh, the C3 stands alone and the C6 is a supporter of the C3. And you wanna have some commonality, you wanna have a bridge. Okay, yes. Oh, thank you. You know, it's, it's, it's education. Is that appropriate? You just mentioned the opposite, so I just want to make sure that. What do you mean? Um, so, we have like C6, and then education and we open C3. We could receive that and just dedicate to that. Okay. So what we did is we, we bridged it in some way, uh, previous leadership did. Um, now it's kind of correlated, like anything that's educational, it goes through C3. C3 uh-huh but the membership size stays in the c6 is that yeah yeah that's exactly how it should run yeah the chamber should be the c6 side and that should be the support of the local businesses and what have you in the c3 what you don't want to do is kind of get lazy and commingle it where the funds get commingled leadership gets commingled you want to make sure you keep them separate Well, a C3 is never going to support the C6. The C3 cannot give money to the C6. The C6 can give money to the C3. 
So the main organization is always the chamber, but the way the money flows has to be from the C6 as a donation to the C3. The donors from the C3 can't be funneling money into the chamber. Okay. don't want to give money to the C6. So we want to provide scholarships for those programs that they wanted to go to the C3. However, because of the structure, we want the program to be in the C6. Is that possible to give scholarships for a program that is being done by the other half? <laughs> I, I know, so. No. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. you can say in conjunction with, supported by, but it is a scholarship of the C3. Yes, and you can be a proud partner, a proud supporter. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, and so I'm going to throw one last thing at you guys, some food for thought. So everybody seems to understand the five, uh, 501C6 and C3, and um, I want to throw in there, consider an LLC. Okay, it's the new route nonprofits that are very profitable are going. So if you have ventures that are profitable, they're going to get taxed anyway, right? Even if you're under a C6 or C3, they're going to get taxed. And so if you own property, if you have assets or a very profitable part of your uh, chamber, consider an LLC for that asset protection because you don't ever want your assets to get touched. So I have business cards. I will pass them around. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. If you want any handouts and samples, I'm happy to send those to you guys as well. And we had one last question. Yes. The C4, I don't know much about C4s. I can't, I apologize. I don't know enough to explain it. I don't really work with C4s. My expertise is with C6s and C3s. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you guys very much. Thank you so much, Carmen, for the great valuable information. So moving on, this will be our next presentation and then afterwards we will go ahead and have lunch. Um, next is a woman who is a legend in the chamber world. She founded, she's one of the founders of the Morris County Hispanic Chamber, uh, statewide Hispanic Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey, uh, co-founder of the Toronto Hispanic Chamber, National Hispanic Chamber and Commerce Health and the Public Private Alliance Foundation of the Dominican Republic and other chambers. She has wealth of chamber knowledge for everybody to share. So without further ado, I introduce Ms. Esperanza Porras Field, President and CEO of Hope Season and founder and president emeritus of the MCHACC. Come on, everybody, get up. Get up, get up. Everybody get up right now. We need a break. You've been sitting there for a long time. So you had to move, come on, ready? So we're going to move the head a little bit. Just move your head, move your arms. You do exercise that you feel comfortable to do, right? You wanna hug somebody, just give her a hug. You know, just relax, right? So now we're going to you repeat after me. Robbers, robber, rules or order. This side say, I agree. I agree. And you say, I disagree. <laughs> Sit down. We are here to agree to disagree, right? And we, you, many of you went to meetings that everything is crazy. It's no agenda, it's no order. The, the president or the chairman, they don't know what they're doing. And as after them, and the meeting is called at six o'clock and it's 11 o'clock and we're still in the meeting. So do you want to go to that meeting? I have one here, I wanna show you. Let's put them my meeting, my first meeting and see how you like it. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Have you ever heard that voice echo in the back of your head saying, this is possible. You can pull this off. No, I'm not talking about that other voice that tries to convince you otherwise. No, I'm talking about the voice. Maybe it was a relative, a good friend, a colleague. Maybe it was some sort of mentor whose voice somehow reverberated in your spirit enough to affect and propel you even years later, helped you do what seemed impossible. 360 Destination Group wants to be one of those voices built around you, felt but not seen, events built around your dreams, experiences built around your goals. You are the hero in this story. We are your eyes and your ears. We are the... That, that's just an example of the mistakes we make in the first meeting. Right? Do you want to share your next board meeting with confidence? The first one. The first one I sent you. The link. In the meantime that they find that meeting, let's talk about who is Robert. Anybody know who was Robert? That guy, exactly. <laughs> he, looks, he looks well put, he, he looks in order, right? All dressed up, but he didn't know anything about having a meeting organized. So Robert, he was named after, he, he, his name was Henry, Maiden Rover, U.S. military officers during the American Civil War. He was invited to a meeting and he, that was a disaster. He didn't know how to do it. So he was so frustrated that he went and thought about having the Robert Russo order. And that's what we use today, the Robert Russo order. And look how many years, 1876. We should know this Robert Russo order by heart if you want to be in the board of directors. So that's how he started. It has been books about the Robert Rules order that you can purchase online. And they very, you know, they, they, not, they don't costly at all. And you can give it to your board of directors. And has been version, update versions of this Robert Rules order, okay? So this, okay. Why the, the Robert Rules order are important? What is it? The main purpose of the Robert Russo order is to maintain an orderly business meeting, whatever in corporate boards, churches, schools, political institutions, venues that are appropriate. So where you see that we had the Robert Russo order? In the government, when you have the meetings with the president of the United States, what do they use? The Robert Russo order. When you go to the parliament, they use the Robert Rules order. It is used for parliamentary procedures and, and for, institution, for the institutions about. So it is important for the presidents or chairmen or the board to know how to use the Robert Rules order. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure many of you know how to do it. So the importance of the Robert Rules order. So why the Robert Rules order are important? Anybody can tell me. Efficiency. Anybody else? Who's that? Organization. Success. What else? Exactly. So we have the Robert Russo order and we apply them when we have the meeting. We all want to benefit about, right? Everybody's going to benefit. So the Robert Rules orders shows how to discuss the topic the, in questions, make motions, the base in the respectful manner and conduct a vote in orderly fashion. So one thing we had to do is forget about personalities. If I don't like you for any reason, Mr. Sanchez, I'm going to conduct myself like a lady. And I don't want to insult you in front of everybody. 
I want to use the Robert Bruce order to make sure that my point is understood by you and vice versa. So we agree to disagree. And that's how it should be. So we all have personalities. We don't like everybody. And the fact that we don't like everybody, that doesn't mean that we, have, we can have a productive meeting. We can have a nice meeting. And at the end of the day, when the meeting is over, we say, thank you very much. You won that motion. And that's it. Be proud of the person who made the motion and the motion was successful. Next. Okay, let's, what do we need for this to be successful for this meeting? So number one, we did an agenda, right? If we have an agenda, the agenda is going to us, help us to be organized. So we have the agenda, we have uh, the, the order of business. Can the order of business can be changed at the beginning of the meeting? Yes or no? How? Exactly. Exactly. So say we had the meeting, the agenda ready, but somebody who is going to present, a, something happened and that person has to leave early. So the person said, Mr. Chairman or Miss Madam Chair, I, I had to leave early because my mom is in the hospital, but I want to present. Can I, can, can I would like to make a motion to change the meeting of the agenda to have me present first. Can we do that? So we need a motion. Exactly. So it's possible to do that. So we're going to need an agenda. So we have an agenda today and the agenda, we're going to need some volunteers. So you can pass the agenda around. We're going to need a, somebody who volunteered to be the chairman of this meeting. Who will be? You will? See, it's easy. I can get people quick, right? Here you go. So you are the chairman of the board. So the guys, the chairman of the board, are going to need a vice president. Who will be the second one? You, the lady over there. She said the chamber is about money. So I bring you some money. Here, $100 for you. Thank you. So we have a chair and we have a vice chair. What else we need here? The first volunteers are going to get some money. The other ones are not going to get anything. So we're going to get now and get, oh, the secretary. Who wants to be the secretary? That's the key position. Who's this? Oh my God. Here, senorita, cien dollars. <laughs> and we're going to need the secretary. We're going to need, of course, the treasure. Oh, Monica, of course, you know. <laughs> Here you go. You have a hundred dollars and the treasure bus. <laughs> So we, we have some money now, right? And who's going to be the director of John Business and Professionals? Who's that, that dynamic person? Oh, I had to pick somebody. Over there, okay. <laughs> so, so can you please write their names, Mr. Chairman? Who is the board? Here, who is it? The John business, what's your name? Karina. Karina, Karina is the John business for Nashville. Okay, so now, uh, what's the next position? Do you have Mr. Chairman, what's the next position? No, 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 you had your agenda there. You don't have it? Oh, okay, who has the agenda? Can you, can you give one to the chairman? Okay, here. So the next position is the treasurer. We had the immediate past chair. Who is that?
What about we have you hope since you are the immediate repast chair? You are the immediate repast chair. Okay. The next one is public relations director. This guy is public relations. <laughs> the chamber is about money, right? And the next one? Member Chiba Marketing. Who is the member Chiba Marketing Director? I see you. Yes. So that will be Juan. Do you need more money? Okay. So let's call the names and say, Tommy, Mr. Chairman, can you please call your people to see the way you can write their names? Who is the Vice President? Excuse me, Vice President. Your name? Melanie? Melanie. Next position call? Uh, Secretary. Secretary. Argentina Ramirez. Next position? Young business and professional. Young business. Karina. From where? Nashville. Next one? Treasurer. Huh? Treasurer. Treasurer. Monica. From where? Jacksonville. Next one? We have our fundraising and scholarship director. We don't have one. We skip it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, we, ha we had to fill out the position. We had to fill out the position. Yeah. Hope Phil. <clears throat> Edward, from where are you going? Utah, where the Mormons are. Are you a Mormon? Good. Membership of marketing. Membership of marketing. Juan Carlos, where are you from, Juan Carlos? Utah, why? Wow, another one, Utah. And that's it? We have more positions open, but we don't have volunteers. So we're going to pick later on. So we're going to fill out those positions. Okay. So now we have a board and determine um, what do we need in order to make sure that we have a quorum? We need how many? Half for one. So you have half plus one, we have a quorum. If we don't, what happened? Can we have the meeting? Sure, we can have a meeting. Can we make motions? No, but we can make one motion. Which one is that motion? <laughs> Goodbye to adjourn. <laughs> we cannot have a meeting, so we can adjourn, right? So that's what we need. So we need, uh, can we specific, uh, we, okay, we need a specific time. So we can have the meeting. How many hours you like to have the meeting? Seven hours? How many? Can you accomplish everything in one hour? Of course, yes. Why? Because you had your report ready and your chairman or president is efficient and every director respect each other and they know how to make motions, you can finish the, uh, the meeting in 30 minutes, right? So also we had to include, include time. what happened if we have, we call the meeting for one hour, but it's one hour we have an issue that we didn't resolve and we had to extend the meeting. What do we do? What is it? Somebody has to make a motion to, stay, to extend the meeting and somebody has to second and you have to say for how long? You say, Mr. Chairman, can we extend this meeting for 10 more minutes or 15 more minutes? And suppose that motion passed, but the gentleman here, he has a, a, a babysitter in the house and he has to leave. So what does that mean? Can you leave? 
Yes, he can leave because he did his hour already. Right? You did your hour, you come on time, you're leaving on time. So I'm sorry, my babysitter is waiting for me. Exactly. So you can leave. But you know, you, what happened is you're very interested in that issue. And now they vote against it because you weren't there. No, he, we have a quorum because he was there. He was there from the beginning. We have a quorum. So he left and, and something was important to him and everybody voted against it, you are locked because you leave, unfortunately. So that's how you do it. So uh, what else we have here? We have new business and old business. I need an example of what is new business and what is old business because everybody messed those two up. So what is a new business? What? Never been discussed. It's, it's not in the bylaws. It's not anywhere. It's something new. That's new business. What goes first? Good, new business or old business? All business. So all business go first. And what you do is uh, you call the business, uh, the old business in the order that they're supposed to be presented. So who made the agenda? to organize all these things. Who made the agenda? The chairman and the secretary. If you want something to put on the agenda, what do you have to do? You have to call the president or send him an email that according to how your organization work, send an email and send it to chairman. I would like you to put in the agenda that I want to pay the sky, the sky green. Are you, what? What do you say? Are you crazy? No, you don't say that because you have to respect people's ideas, right? Sure, no problem, he put it in the agenda. So this is the 13 he's getting that day. So that will be placed in the order that he received. You may get to it, you may don't. Because remember, you have so many times, so many hours to do your meeting. So you can put that on the agenda. What happened if the chairman say no? I don't want to put that in the agenda. This is correct. No. He has to put it in the agenda. He has to respect you. He has the Fed chair of responsibility to respect the board of directors. So he has to put it on the agenda, all right? Well, each organization have different days. So have, I recommend that at least five days before to prepare and you receive the agenda at least five days, so it's a minimum. That way everybody's prepared. I recommend that all the reports be in writing. So that way, when you say your report and you send your report, everybody knows exactly what we're going to talk about. The problem is when you start speaking about your reports, so that takes longer. Do you understand? So the report should be sent to the secretary. Whoever the secretary is, they should receive that report. Go ahead. No, it's not assumed because when it's you ten, you know, they, they will have a section that say committee reports. So that your report was already sent to everybody. So when you, they have a report, you can review quick. You say, as you know, my report, I send my report to you and the highlight points, all my reports are A, B, C. And that's it. Now the problem comes when people make reports, say, they say, this is my report. And they say, I'm going to go to the convention at the United States Chamber of Commerce in Las Vegas. That's new business, old business, or what is this? This is a report? No, reports are things that you did, not that you're going to do. Because you already did that. So it's when you reported. 
But if you're going to do something, it's either going to go a, a new business or you are there in old business. But it's not a report. A report is the past. What you accomplish or the organization accomplished. Okay? So announcements are at the end and the journal. So any announcement, the, the, the chairman can say, I want to let you know that we had the festival, whatever, whatever, that we have, uh, we are invited by the governor this and this day, and whatever announcements it is are there. So this is the things that you have to remember. The quorum, we already say that we need 50 uh, and a half in order to have a quorum. But that is for the board of directors. But what if you have an annual meeting with your general membership? So depends, like she said, on the bylaws. We personally in Morris County have an annual meeting with all the members. And all the members had the right to vote that day. So we have a specific clause that say how many can be in there in order to have quarrel. So that depends on each of the organization's model and bylaws, okay? So then we have, uh, we need uh, needed for official business, meaning can be begin without core, we already say that. Chairperson, a secretary responsible for recognizing the quorum, okay? In an absence of quorum, what happened? You can discuss something, but you cannot vote. That's what happened, okay? So make a motion, here's the trick part, how to make motions. So uh, if we're talking about a, any proposals and we wanna make a motion, the motion has to be clear, it has to have all the ingredients to be clear and people can understand. So I make a motion that we had the gala in December 6th, at the Brescian Manor. It is clear? Everybody is supposed to know what the Brescian Manor is. So somebody second the motion. So you made the motion, he second the motion, but he didn't, he don't really like that thing about the Brescian Manor because he has a better place. Why he second the motion if he doesn't really inside agree? It's just to take it on the table. So he said, yeah, okay, I'll make a motion. I'm second the motion. But during the debate, you say, why you wanna go to the British Manor? Don't you know that we have uh, the rest a Biba restaurant that is better than that and it's Latino? So I think he say, even though he second the motion, I like Biba restaurant because it's better. Okay, so I said everybody here the debate and everybody had their opinion. Now the chairman called for the vote. All the sooner you voted again for your motion and he voted against it. Did he have the right to do that? Yes, he does, because he only voted second the motion in order to take the motion out of the table, in order to facilitate, to move. Okay, but also maybe during the discussion, you finally say, you know, he's right. So you vote against your own motion. Can you do that? Yes, you can do that. All right? So that's in reference to motions. Uh, usually they call the subject matter the question. The question. What is the question? So the question is the motion itself. That's the, that's the motion. When you're debating, what do you have to do? Number one, listen. Listen to the motion. The chairman need to be very clear and repeat the motion. So he make a motion to do the gala. He, if you want to be the chairman, you had to repeat. Mr. So-and-so, you had to call each other with respect. Mr. Madam Chair, Mr. Rodriguez, Mrs. whatever. You just don't say, hey, you. You just respect the person. So you made the motion. The chairman repeat the motion. Mr. Rodriguez say that he would like to have the gala. So that way the motion is clear. Once somebody uh, make a motion and the second person second the motion, now what do we have? We have a debate. 
docent framework of the motion. And you don't have 10 hours to speak about the framework of the motion. You have 30 seconds, one minute. Well, it, it's not discussion at all. He called for the, for the vote. Those in favor of the motion, those against the motion, and that's it, get it over. Don't complicate yourself. This is easy. We are not in the parliament, you know? So it's focus on the issues and knowing the personalities. Because I don't like somebody, so I don't focus on the issue. I focus, yeah, but you see how you speak? You see how you put that motion on the table? You don't even refer to the chairman as Mr. Chairman, and you start the fighting. We can't fight. It's about the motion. That's about the issue, not your personality. So you have to take the personalities out of the equation, please. Avoid, yes. Okay, I have a good example to give you. When I was in the United States Chamber of Commerce, I don't wanna say the name, but we have a very excellent, I happen to be a, a chairman female and she was good. And she's directing the meeting. And I'm going to give this personality a name. And that was Peter, just to say a name. Peter, keep going. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Peter. Okay, yes, yes. Peter, my chair. Yes, Peter, two times. Third time, he goes, my chair. She ignore him. Excuse me? Yes, you? You? And she ignore him. So finally, and he keep, <clears throat> and he jumping out of the chair. So finally, I said, Mr. Peter, I know she, he said to her, are you, my chair, are you going to acknowledge me? She said, no, I already acknowledged you two times and you were, were unable to uh, get your point, cross your point. So please, if you don't behave properly, you can leave the room. Can she do that? Yes. No, she stayed. <laughs> he was too proud because it was a very famous person. Like she said before, he wants his way or the highway, and he couldn't get it. So he was destructive, you know what I mean? So it's no good. So avoid questions and motives, you know? Why is somebody making motion? And you say, I, I know why you made the motion because you're friends with that guy in that restaurant, are you? Why you say that? You know, I know why you made the motion because you like that woman over there, don't you? That's an accusation. You can't do that. You just go to, uh, you know, the questions, not to the morals, okay? And mainly be polite. Just be polite and wait for your turn and wait for the chairman to recognize you. And that's pretty much the simple way to conduct a meeting. You have in your package different ways to use when you're in a meeting. For instance, I don't, it's not here, but it's in your book. If somebody uh, say, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Spedes is out of order. What does that mean? Mr. Perez is out of order because it's off topic, exactly. So we're wasting time. So he has to go back to the agenda. We all, remember, we're going to speak about what is in the agenda. We cannot speak about crazy stuff that you think about at that particular moment. And the chairman is the leader and the leader need to know how to conduct that meeting and stop people, okay? It's other different type of motions or suggestions that you have in the book, but it's in reality too long for me to go over all of them, but you can learn the book was yes, was no, et cetera, okay? So let's go to the next slide. For instance, in this case, Mr. Smith, Director of Public Relations, make a motion to make a donation to the Children's Hospital. Easy, right? So now Mr. Vega Treasure second the motion to make the donation to the Children's Hospital. So what are the Mrs. Reese is the chairwoman 
she entertained the motion, asked her, what is an entertain the motion? What does that mean? When I say entertain the motion, speak about, entertain the motion, you know, sometimes nobody wants to entertain the motion, so you just vote directly, but you have it, me you know, to entertain the motion, just know what, why we want to give uh, uh, the hospital money again. We give the hospital money 20 years ago. Yeah, that was 20 years ago, but we want to do it now. So that's entertaining the motion, yeah. Yes, you need to, yeah. In order to the discussion start, you need to have a motion. Okay, so what about you want to make the motion and nobody have a second motion. What happened? Died. The motion died. Okay? So that's what happened. So nobody second the motion is dead. So forget about it. So you had to think about other ways to make a motion in the second round. So here it's very much you entertain the motion. And, and, and the chairman, the chairwoman in this case, uh, called for a... Uh, the, uh, the vote and uh, she continued to announce the results. So when everybody votes, say no, say you had 10 people, six approve it and four no. So the chairman has to say, the motion has been passed uh, with six yes and four no. Do you have to run the minutes who uh -huh. didn't vote? No, because Remember, this is confidentiality yeah. agreement. You had the right to, the, to disagree and you had the right to agree. The main thing is, yes, wasn't uh, to get, everybody didn't vote. Only few voted yes, only the other ones voted no. All right, so here, this is where we're going to do the activity. So we have a chairman here. The question is the children's hospital. We had two things in the agenda. One is the children's hospital, and the other one we have few vacant seats. So we wanna see if we can nominate some people for those seats, and that's it, that's the meeting of today. So we have a chairman, you have some people, you can call attendance, you can do your thing, and see if you don't do it right, so I will let you know. Okay, let's just start. Juan Carlos, are you here? Okay. <laughs> Who else? I think we have more. Director of Public Relations. John Business Sun. You had to ask the secretary that we have a quorum. So, good, go ahead. Okay, question. What did he say at the beginning, the first one? Okay, do you say article or do you say first? What did you say? First order of business. Order of business, he did it correct. So the first order of business is that, okay. The person who made the motion, but we don't have it yet. So the first order of business is, I'll stop right here. If you have a guess, 
for any reason that I don't recommend to many guests to come to the board meetings because they take your time. If you have a guest, where the guest you want the guest to go at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end? Yes, that way the guest is free. Three minutes and adios. Let's see, you don't want this, the guest to stay there. So we don't have a guest right now, thanks God. So we can go ahead and do the, business, the, the meeting of the business. So explain what, you know, the first sort of business is that we want to have, uh, make a donation to the children's hospital. Uh, they have been talking to us about this. We have been working with them and you can say, it's a good idea. And uh, anybody wants to discuss this subject or anyone, anybody want to make a motion to, donate to the children's hospital or how? So the floor is open, so go ahead. Would someone like to make a motion? Melanie makes a motion. Is it second? Argentina seconds the motion. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, so <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that amount? One million, she want to give one million. And why, and why, and for what program? <laughs> conflict of interest, tell it, it's conflict of interest. <laughs> Very well. So we have, we have a motion. Uh, to donate $800 million to St. Jude's Hospital. Do we have a second? Yeah, but you, you, she did, the, her motion is not clear. You had to tell her, your motion is not clear. Can you please clarify your motion? Budget. Good. Now it's clear. Well, well, there's no amount. How can it? She'd say. She said. Oh, okay. Okay. She said 100 million. <laughs> Very well. Uh, so we have, we have a motion uh, to donate uh, $800 million to St. Jude's Hospital. Uh, do I have a second? Angelina seconds the motion. All those in favor? No, so you repeat the motion, Mr. Chairman. All those in favor of donating $800 million to the St. Jude's Hospital, all in favor? As to, as to the motion, as the discussion. Okay. All those in favor? All those opposed? Oh, you took, excuse me, he took the, the vote. You had to entertain the motion, I apologize. Entertain the motion. Okay, let, let's discuss. Okay, so we, uh, we have a motion uh, and second. Let's discuss the motion. Does any, and do you have any um, opinions or comments? Yes. Okay. Anyone else have any comments? Yes, Karina. Okay. 
dos enfermos, nada, dos seguidos. So she's not in favor of the motion. Anybody? In that case, uh, what the chairman need to, to do is we have a motion on the table, we have a second, the discussion. I know you're all excited about this motion, but we had to refer this motion to a legal counsel or to the committee to investigate more about. Okay. All right. Right. So, <laughs> yes, so in that case, I said the discussion and I said he understood now exactly what it's all about. So you can table that motion for a future discussion. So that motion will be in all business for the next meeting or for the meeting before until we have all the ingredients that we need to do in order to pass that motion. Because we wasted their time. We don't have this million dollars or, or the legalities so, or us giving that kind of donation is not there. Okay. So what else we have in the agenda? Uh, the next item is uh, open board positions. Okay. Well, we have business and technology, events and activities. Do you have anybody interested in that position? You have Pablo here. It's very interesting. <laughs> Business and technology. So you want to introduce Pablo and you want to ask him why he wants to, was interested in this board. Pablo, thank you for being interested in the board uh, position of um, Business and Technology. Can you please uh, introduce yourself and tell us why you're interested? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Pablo Garita. Uh, I'm interested in this position. Uh, I feel I'll be a great asset to this position. And I think integrating technology to business is a great help to uh, our chamber and obviously our businesses, which we're all part of. And obviously, uh, time is money. So that's, that's a good thing. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, we would like to, um, someone would like to make a motion to, um, let's take a vote. Thank you. Do anybody wants to make a motion to accept Pablo Garita for the position of, right? Position of uh, business and technology. Okay, there's a motion by Melanie uh, to um, have uh, Pablo Garita as a business and technology director. Is there a second? Jennifer. Second by Jennifer Rodriguez. Yes, uh, Juan, uh, Juan Carlos. I'm sorry? Okay, you, what, you okay, are. That's a, uh, okay, but, uh, does anyone else uh, have any opinions about Mr. Garita? Maybe our discussion, legal any or discussion? someone has. What did you have to do? You're going to speak about him and his personality or, or his interests. You had to get him out of the room, right? You had to say, Mr. Garita, thank you very much. Let's us discuss this matter. And can you please wait for outside for a minute and we call you right back. So he leaves the room. So you talk about and you say yes or no, or maybe somebody say, I don't, I, if this is confidential, but Mr. Garita was expelled from his last board position in this organization or something that we don't know. 
Or maybe everybody's happy and say, fantastic, this guy is phenomenal. So you call him back and everybody say, congratulations, you are welcome to the board, right? So that's it. So go ahead, finish. Okay, so uh, we have a motion uh, to have Ms. Ogarita as uh, uh, Director for uh, Business and Technology, second by, uh, by Jennifer. Four. All those in favor? Four. All those opposed? All those abstained? Motion passes. And we bring in Mr. Garita and we welcome him to the board. Okay, very good. So like that, but of course, before this happened, you would have in your pockets his bio, his credentials that when you come to the meeting, you already knew that he was going to come in and he was going to be nominated for this position. Now, question. We have three positions uh, vacant. Do you wait for the General Assembly when everybody is going to reorganize the board or you do it as they come along? I would, uh, I would host it and ask for nomination. No, okay, yeah, okay, one way to do it. Anybody else? Your responsibility is to have a full board. So if you resign and he resigned, if you have a good leader the next month, you already had two more coming in. It's like, think about your own business. You sell tamales and the woman who made the tamales resigned. Do you wait until next month or you try to fill the position immediately? Because you need to have a full board all the time. You wanna make sure that that board is full, of course, you had to announce it, you can announce it, you can say, and depends on the bylaws as well. Maybe the bylaws tells you not to do it this way, do it that way. But reality is that you need to have your full board in order to do business, it's better. And maybe some bylaws say that you had 10 board or directors or six. You wanna have quality, not quantity. You wanna make sure that everybody works. So, okay, continue with your meeting. You, you already did what you had to do. You have any new business, anything else? Uh, I'd like to um, make a, adjourn this meeting. Can I have a, mo a motion to adjourn? Pablo makes a motion to adjourn. A second? He's quick, right? Second by Melanie. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? I oppose, I wanna stay here. <laughs> Motion passes. Okay. Uh, we have our next meeting uh, October 30th. And uh, Any announcement? It's time for lunch. Any announcements? Announcement? At lunch? Yes, I'm saying. Okay. Question What was missing? You did a meeting, but some things were missing here. What did he forgot? And you nobody say anything. That is so important. Huh? He said at the Exactly. Two things very important. Very. To vote for the minutes. The minutes were never presented. Nobody spoke about the meetings and he forgot about. Of course, he did it purposely for, to see anybody say, hey, what about the minutes of the last month? So that's important. Another very, very important thing why he forgot and the treasure was quiet. Pressure, how much money we have in the bank? We have a hundred dollars, but you never told anybody that we need money. <laughs> exactly. So all of you can, sometimes we are not perfect. Maybe the chairman forgets something. You said, Mr. Chairman, excuse me, I apologize, but we need to go over there a treasure report first. We wanna make sure that the treasurer uh, let us know what, how much money we, or what expenses we have, or how much money we have in the bank or whatever is in reference to the treasurer. Somebody could have said the secretary, what's the secretary? The secretary, what happened to the minutes? Oh. 
It's there. Yeah, well, it should have, it should have been detailed on the agenda. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Left side. Yeah. 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 Okay, so it's there. So, but doesn't matter, you can still remember, yeah. That depends on the, your policy procedures or your bylaws. Um, sometimes it's necessary to approve these minutes because they accumulate. So it's for some reason you forgot and you guys agree at the end that it's going to be sent to everybody, but you cannot approve the minutes that day because you don't have the minutes with you. You had to read the minutes and you had to be prepared, all right? Wait a minute, you're talking about the board of directors and the general assembly, which is called the general membership. Yes. Okay, the general membership is once a year. Yes. All right, and the board of directors is every month. So what's the question? So, but I mean, is it, because when we're with the board of directors, obviously we're going to go to that once a year, I'm sorry. It's okay, go ahead. Yeah. That's, that's normal, yes. You do the slay. What, what we don't do in our chamber, we don't do elections for the chairman or president of the board and the general assembly. Why? Because you don't want anybody coming through your board from the street. You want to make sure that the person is selected among themselves because you already know who are your peers and you know if Pablito happened to be good or bad. So you don't wanna let Pablito as an next chairman, he just come in, he doesn't know anything. So the only ones who know that is you guys that are in the board of directors. So we do this in November and we do by share, right? Chair by share in November. And then the rest of the positions we do in the general assembly with the, the general membership. Because you don't want to dismantle the organization when you do things at the same time and you, you miss the opportunity to have a good chairman that was sitting in the table and was trained already. You know, it's you sitting in the board and he is leaving. So you had to elect, they elect you before. So it's why they say, President elect, because you already know what's going on and everybody else knows what's going on. Any more questions? We select, that depends on your organization. If you wanna do, if you think it's important president and vice president, Treasure position is very important. So sometimes the three positions, because they, but sometimes you don't have a treasure. It will be nice if you have a CPA or a treasure or an accounting. So you don't, so it will be with the general uh, assembly, with the general meeting. Yes, we, we do have it in the bylaws that every November, the board of directors will elect president and vice president. Every, we, did, we leave the treasure out. And the only reason is because I explained to you, sometimes in your board, you don't have the right person to take that position. So we give them an opportunity to the membership, to the general membership, okay? So, uh, I have a yeah. Oh, go ahead. What's that? You have what? Okay, we do have an executive committee in the bylaws, and we have um, 
but mainly we use the officers. We have an officers and directors. So the officers are the presidents, vice president, uh, what is it, uh, the vice president, the treasurer, but we also have an executive. Uh, your business and immediate past share. Any Why the immediate past share is important that you keep it there? Why? Yes, because that person know what's going on with the organization. You need the knowledge, you need to know. But the only thing is that the former chair doesn't have a vote. You know, the former chair has a voice, an opinion. I'm come here to help you, but does it, what the time for vote, the person doesn't vote. So in, in, in Morris County Hope is the, the immediately past chair. So she goes to every meeting, but she has no vote. But she has a voice. <laughs> and she has a big voice, right? <laughs> Another question. Yes. Yes. No, we have no. We have an advisory council, and also we have advisors to the board. Advisors to the board is our legal council, our CPA, our webmaster, myself as a former, and we have what else? So we have different advisors, but we have a corporate advisory council, and Hope is the chairman of the corporate advisor. She represents Coca-Cola and she directs that meeting. And so how many do you have in your corporate board? Christine, you have Johnson & Johnson, you have Inca-Cola, she has Coca-Cola. So all the big corporations, so everything that we do and the, they do in the board, she related to the corporate advisor. The corporate advisor has a vote. What are they there to do? Advice, Advice listen to us. And what another thing we need for them? Exactly, you know what I mean? It's because a lot of them come and see it and everything, but never give us a penny. We need money. We are no profit organization. We need to raise money. Huh? Exactly. So we need the money, okay? I got just one regarding our Eduardo's question. Yeah. Uh, we, so we have term limits for all of, all of our uh, board members. So um, after you complete your your, your term, you have you can you have to step aside for one year, and after one year, then you can come back and and run for another position. So. Yeah. You know, that can create, yeah. It's in, right, it's in your bylaws. Yeah, right. yeah. In your model, the attorney is not on the board? No, the, the, the lawyer only advise. Who's that? CPA. CPA is not on the board. We do, we can have a CPA as a treasurer, but we have a CPA, he do our taxes. You know, he do our payroll, we have to, you know, he, but he's not on the board of directors. Yeah. I couldn't understand your question. Oh yeah, he, you can only hold one position at the time. If you're representing us as a CPA in the board, you are not going to represent us as a CPA as an advisor. So we had two different people to do that. And it's clean and easy, you know? So in conclusion, what about somebody, my first man here, I'll read the first in conclusion. Ness? And last one. Go ahead.
All right. So let's see now. We couldn't see the first video, and the first video was very disorganized. But let's see. We see the last video to see if we can have the right one. Do you want to chair your next board meeting with confidence? Are you familiar with Robert's Rules of Order? Robert's Rules of Order is a set of rules and guidelines used to facilitate fair and effective meetings for many organizations. While applying a set of rules might seem like more work, using Robert's Rules of Order will make meetings efficient so that your board can get more done in less time. This can be very important when you have board members or presenters tying into meetings electronically. These tips and takeaways can help boards use Robert's Rules of Order to chair your next board meeting with confidence. To start a board meeting, the chairperson will announce the meeting will now come to order. The chair will follow through with agenda items, hear reports of officers, committees, and staff, ask for new and old business, and provide announcements. In order to conduct business, boards use motions. A motion is used to address a topic or idea to be discussed. Only one motion is to be discussed at a time. However, a board can approve several things at once after discussion. There are steps to use with every motion. First, a board member will raise a motion. Another board member will second a motion. The chair will then restate the motion and ask for discussion. After the board discusses the motion and the issue, after there's dialogue within the board on the item, the chair will ask for a vote on the motion and then the chair will announce the results of the vote. There are tips and rules to remember on Robert's Rules of Order. Adkins and Company has developed a Robert's Rules of Order reference document that is available to guide you through your next board meeting with confidence. Contact us by email or by phone. Okay, thank you very much. Did you have any other questions? I'd be here. Yes. What's it? Extortions. That's the other. The other version? Yeah, that's the other version. The oh. Other. oh, okay. I didn't know. Ever. No. Anybody else? Yeah. Did you make a motion? I will be there. And things will happen immediately. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esperanza. So we will now go ahead and take a short 30 minute lunch break. We have some grab and go uh, lunch boxes for you to go ahead and help yourself to. We have some juices and I believe they're gonna be taking out some sodas soon, um, but we'll resume everything. We'll resume our, our next presentation at 1245. So thank you guys. <laughs>